but Gina, I love you! Oh, come on, Robbie. We only slept together a couple of times. No one falls in love that fast. But I did, Gina! Please, I'm begging you! Give me another chance! Don't leave me! Stop being so miserable, Robbie! I just don't want to be with you anymore! Your wallet is mostly empty, just like your mind. So... so it's all about money? That's it? You're leaving me because I'm not rich? No, that's not it. You are a pathetic tool. Suck eggs, beggar. Gina walked away, stomping her high heels, leaving me in the darkness of the sidewalks, when I heard a woman's voice from the house on my left. You won't get her back this way. I can help you. If you want. Chills ran down my spine. A weird old lady dressed like a gypsy was standing on the porch. I noticed a glowing signboard on her yard. Psychic, Lady Pearl, $15 per reading. I was already in deep shit, so I thought, why not? She took me inside her house. There were red curtains and candle lights all over the house. A small table stood in the middle of the living room with a crystal ball resting on the top. Once we sat down, she started running her bony hands on the crystal ball. To my surprise, black smoke started spreading inside the white crystal ball. The path won't be easy. I will do anything to get her back. I love her. You will need to put a love spell on her. Only then will she be back. Here, take this. She gave me a small vial with a colorless liquid in it. Once you drink it by mixing something that belongs to her, she won't be able to resist herself. No matter how far she is, she will be back to you by midnight. What do you mean by something that belongs to her? Stupid boy, don't waste my time asking stupid questions. A lock of hair or chopped fingernail Anything that came from her body. Okay, okay, understood. But you sure this'll work? Damn you, Doubting Lady Pearl. You fool! Please, don't get angry. I'm desperate. She's my soulmate tonight. Go home and do exactly what I said. She'll be knocking at your door before dawn. <laughs> I paid her $15 and came home with the vial. I sat on the bed remembering that even a few hours back Gina and I were lying on it after making amorous love, and now she <laughs> left me because I had no money. No, Gina, you are not getting rid of me so quickly. I went straight to the washroom and started going through whatever Gina left behind. I didn't find much except her hairbrush in the bin. As gross as it sounds, I plucked one long strand of hair and put it into the vial. As soon as the hair touched the liquid, it turned blood red. I looked at myself in the mirror. I can't believe I'm doing this. <sighs> Whatever. I gulped the disgusting potion in one move and immediately felt a warm wave sliding down my throat. Everything went blurry and I grabbed the sink so that I don't fall. After a few seconds, I stood inside the bathroom like that, and then everything went back to normal. I came out to my bedroom and looked at the time. It was 10.30 already. I was so excited and anxious that I skipped dinner. I lay down on the bed and sleep closed my eyelids. I rushed to the main door and opened it in one jolt. Lightning sparked, and there she was. Gina, you... Yes, she came back. She was standing on my doorstep with a calm face. There was no anger, no denial, just her pretty face staring at me. Can I come in? Yeah, yes, come on in. This is your house. She got in and I closed the door. My insides screamed, thank you, Lady Pearl. Thanks a ton. You gave me my soulmate back. Gina sat down on the couch, but there were a few things off about her. She was behaving differently. Her eyes were still, like they had no vision. Her skin was pale like porcelain. I realized it was the spell that made her puppet-like. But it's fine. Once she starts loving me as much as I love her, I will visit Lady Pearl and ask her to break Gina out of the spell. I sat down beside her and hold her hand. 
Gina, I am so happy you came back. I promise I'll earn a lot of money and then you'll have no more reasons to leave me. I swear. She looked at me with the same expressionless face and said, I feel cold. Let's go inside. You must be tired. We can lie down on the bed. I'll keep you warm the entire night. We got up and went to the bedroom. Heavy rain started outside, accompanied by thunderstorms and lightning. Our bodies laid side by side, and I took Gina in my arms. God, you are freezing. I grabbed her tightly to warm her up. I felt bad for having to put a spell on her, but I had no other choice. I went to stroke her hair, but as my hand touched the back of her head, my hand felt cold and sticky. The back of her head was soaking wet. I clearly remember it wasn't raining when she arrived at my doorstep. How come the back of her head was wet then? The room was dark and I couldn't see well, but as the lightning struck, I saw a thick liquid smeared on my hand. I turned on the bedside lamp and froze in fear. It wasn't rainwater on my palm, but black, dense blood. Just then, my phone rang and I saw my mom calling me. I was so stunned to even move that the call went off to my voicemail. I heard my mom saying, You there? Please call me once you get this. I just got horrible news. The girl you were dating, she's on the news. The cops are reporting from the crime scene. I just saw her picture flashing on the screen. The news people are asking for her close ones to contact the cops. They say she's been killed in some car crash a few hours ago. Please, call me as soon as possible. I was still holding Gina in my arms. Her face were buried in my chest. I could feel my body getting numb in fear. I slowly pushed her away and saw she was looking dead right at me. Bloody tears were rolling down her eyes. She said in a sobbing voice, Why do I feel cold? My lips stopped moving. Heart stopped beating. If Gina's dead, then, then who's in my arms? Just then, a flashback of Lady Pearl's words reverberated in my head. Once you drink it by mixing something that belongs to her, she won't be able to resist herself. No matter how far she is, she will be back to you by midnight. Gina's sobbing face now changed into a sick smile. Aren't you going to keep me warm? <laughs> <laughs> I pushed her away and heard her lifeless body rolling over the bed, falling on the floor. I ran out of my house. As I ran, I began realizing the power of the vicious love spell. It made my soulmate come back. It made my dead soulmate come back. Have you ever heard the phrase, dreams always come true? What would you do if you lived that phrase in your own flesh? Or rather, what would you do if your dreams come true, but you only have nightmares? I will now tell you how, as a child, all my nightmares came true in one night, and if it wasn't for a stroke of luck and a lot of help, that nightmare would still be tormenting me every day until it took me with it. The nightmare started when I was just an eight-year-old girl. My parents were worried about me. I had a lot of sleep disorders and I was doing poorly in school because I was always tired. They didn't understand what was wrong with me, and I can't blame them. I never told them what I was going through. I was terrified of falling asleep. I used to stay awake as long as I could. At some point, my eyes would close and I would have to face my nightmares. They were always the same. I was at home, dressed in a Christmas sweater. I heard a noise in the dining room and I went over to see if it was Santa Claus with my presence. When I get to the dining room, Santa has his back turned. Alerted by the noise I make, he turns around and looks at me. Something's wrong. His face. His face. Santa is not my friend. Santa is a monster. Santa stares at me. I can't move. I can't do anything. And he knows it. Suddenly, he walks towards me with his hands raised, ready to catch me. Everything goes black, but I feel strong pain in my head. Suddenly, full of sweat and in tears, I woke up. That horrendous dream tormented me for years and years. 
until one day when I had already turned 14, I decided to abandon my dreams and enter my house on Christmas. Meg, are you sure you don't want to go to your uncle's house with us? No, Dad, I'm fine. I'm just really sleepy. I feel like I can sleep today if I stay. I lied. I just didn't want to go to my uncle's house. I don't know why, but I always try to avoid him. Um, okay. Are, are you sure? Your uncle always asks for you. Since your aunt passed away, he doesn't see you. You must go sooner or later. Of course, Dad. I will. I just feel like I can rest. I feel so bad. Okay. Well, if you regret it, just call us and we'll come for you immediately. We are only a few kilometers away. As soon as my parents left, I made myself a coffee. I was very sleepy, but it was Christmas, and I had to avoid sleeping at all costs, at least until the 26th. I was whisking my coffee in the kitchen, staring blankly, until a sound coming from the dining room alerted me. Confused, I put down the coffee and grabbed a knife, carefully approaching the source of the noise. When I saw the source of the sound, I froze. It was someone dressed as Santa Claus in the same position as in my dreams. Santa turned around and had exactly the same face I saw for so long when I closed my eyes. No, 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 this has to be a dream. I pinched myself as hard as I could, but I was in pain. This was not a dream. This was happening. Who are you? What do you want? Why are you chasing me? Why are you doing this to me? No! Get away from me! It may be repeating the same thing as in the dream, but this was real life, and I wasn't going to stand by while he attacked me. With Santa's distraction, I ran into the bathroom and locked the door. On the other side, I could hear banging, kicking, and even headbutting. Santa was trying to get in. Get away from me! My parents just went to get something. They'll be here any minute. I was lying. My parents weren't coming for hours. As soon as I said this, the banging stopped. Had I scared him? Now I just had to be patient. Wait for the right moment to run out of the house. you get in here? The door's locked. There, there's no way you could have gotten in. I stood up to open the door and escape, but the very lock I put on it was what gave Santa enough time to grab me by the hair and pull me into his bag. Inside it, I kicked, resisted, and tried to break it, but nothing worked. This was not a normal bag. In the dark, I felt blows all over my body, as if Santa was pulling me down the staircase. I screamed and screamed as much as I could. I closed my eyes and cried, surrendering, until suddenly I heard a familiar voice. Megan, what's wrong with you? My baby, what happened to you? I opened my eyes again and there was no Santa near me. I wasn't even in the bag. Megan, are, are you okay? Are you hurt? Dad, Mom, where's Santa? He was carrying me down the stairs. Santa? Sweetheart, you were alone. We both saw you falling down the stairs by yourself. We came back because we forgot the presents for your cousins. When we arrived, we saw you falling down the stairs alone. There's nobody here. Meg, we're your parents. Trust us. There's something you're not telling us. Fortunately, I had been unharmed by the fall. My mother helped me up and escorted me to the kitchen table, while my father made me tea. It was hard, but... I told them everything. After that, I went to a lot of psychologists and also told them about my dreams. After many years and some hypnosis therapy sessions, I discovered that just as I was hiding things from my parents, my brain was hiding things from me. With the psychologist in front of me, I had Santa's dream again. But this time, it was not a dream. It was a memory. I was only eight years old. I heard Santa Claus in the dining room, so I went to spy on him dropping off presents. I found Santa, but when I saw his face, I realized it wasn't Santa. It was my uncle in disguise. He wasn't dropping off presents. He was choking my aunt, who was on the floor crying. 
I screamed, terrified, not understanding what was happening. This alerted my uncle, who turned around and looked at me. What are you doing? Santa? What's going on? I don't understand you. Furious and clearly under the effects of some heavy drug, my uncle walked quickly towards me and without my reacting, threw me against the wall and hit my head. When they woke me up the next day, my parents thought I had fallen. I didn't remember anything. When I talked to my parents about it, they both went to confront my uncle. My father fought with him, and in the middle of the fight, my cousins were almost my age. They burst into tears and asked us for help, yelling at us that not only did my uncle beat them, but they had witnessed how he killed my aunt a year after that Christmas. It has been 10 years since it happened. My uncle's in jail, and my cousins live with me and my parents. With a lot of time and therapy, I stopped dreaming about Santa and started to enjoy Christmas. I spent my whole life thinking about how to escape the monster of my dreams, when in reality they were just trying to warn me. Warn me that this monster was real and was much closer than I thought. My husband Miles loves New Year's. He goes overboard with the joy of celebrating the holidays. Every year we travel to our country house for a romantic beginning to the coming year. It's a big house, but last year, things didn't go as planned. Upon arriving, we took it straight to the bedroom and made love. Miles and I have been high school sweethearts and we still can't get enough of each other. After quite a pleasurable hour, we both decided to cook dinner together. The snow had already covered our garden like a white blanket. I made hot chocolate while Miles started the fireplace. We were laughing and joking when I saw a shadowy figure standing outside the back door. Seeing me stare at the back patio with a confused face, Miles asked, What is it? I think there's someone outside. The patio light was off, so it was dark outside. I switched on the lights and went to check. To my surprise, there was no one. The tall hills facing our house stood silent. The snow and the pine woods were mute observers. God, it's so cold here. Let's go in. Maybe we should check the property. What? There's no one out here. We're in the middle of nowhere, Rhonda. You probably imagined it. Fine. Even though I came in, I still couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched by an unknown intruder. Miles was right, though. There's nothing but mountains and snowy woods surrounding our house. It would be difficult for any human being to survive in this cold without being seen. Miles cooked delicious steak for dinner. We had a good time and ate our tummies full. There was unfinished food on my plate and both of us were too busy to clean the dishes that night. We left it all on the dinner table and went back upstairs to watch a movie and drink till the countdown. The time went well, and we eventually kissed each other, wishing a happy new year once the clock struck twelve. Thinking of going snowboarding early in the morning, we decided to get some sleep. I don't exactly remember how I woke up, but once I did, I felt thirsty. I forgot to fill the jug in the bedroom, so I walked downstairs. As I came downstairs, my eyes suddenly noticed the dishes on the table. They were licked clean. I slowly scanned the house with tense eyes. I heard the basement door creak open behind me, followed by heavy footsteps. Someone was down there, and now walking towards me. The house was in complete darkness. The moonlight from the windows was my only source to see. I wanted to scream for my husband, but my voice died in my throat. The footsteps got closer each second and my heartbeat got faster. Whoever it was had eaten our leftovers and decided to take shelter in the basement. But now he was coming out to reveal himself. I stood like a statue, eyes wide open staring at the dark basement. The footsteps stopped and then a hand hovered from the darkness and waved at me. Follow me. Thinking this is just a nightmare, I still didn't react. But then a face came out of the darkness and I almost had a heart attack. 
It was a man wearing President Ronald Reagan's mask. Through eye holes, I could see blood-red, drunk eyes looking at me up and down. I finally screamed, Miles! And I turned around to run upstairs when the man came out from the basement. Not in my wildest dreams, I expected what I saw next. The man was completely naked, wearing nothing. He held a dried maple leaf over his junk and then began laughing hysterically. <laughs> Happy New Year! I ran upstairs at full speed, hearing the man chasing me. I closed the bedroom door and woke up my husband. Miles! Miles! Ugh, what is it, Rhonda? There's a crazy man in our house! God, not again. You probably had a bad dream. No! He's outside our room! Wake up! That's when the knocking began. Loud banging along with psychotic screams. Ah, open the door! Open! Open now! I came to wish you a happy new year! You need to say it back! My husband woke up and realized I wasn't imagining things this time. He grabbed the baseball bat from under the bed and yelled back at the naked man. What the hell do you want? I want you to open the door! Get out of my house! And what if I don't? You know you can't call the cops here! <laughs> he kept hitting the door with his fist and then stopped. Everything went silent. Did he... did he leave? I don't know. We walked close to the door, and Miles placed his ear to overhear the sounds from the other side of the door. For a few seconds, nothing happened. And then suddenly, I heard a mechanic rumble. A tip of a chainsaw started cutting through our bedroom door. Yes, a freaking chainsaw. Miles would have been chopped off like a pig if he didn't move in time. I screamed at the top of my lungs, and the man cut a big hole in our bedroom door. He inserted his head from it, and Miles was shocked. Holy crap, who are you? I told you, he's crazy. Let me in so I can wish you a happy new year, and then hug you guys. I took the baseball bat from Miles' hand because he chickened out at that moment. I swung the bat at full speed and hit the psycho on his head. The sound of a skull crack rent the air, and behind that mask, a trail of blood started dripping from his head. No! What did you do? Miles ran as the man collapsed on the floor. He opened the door in one go and took off his mask. Jeff! Jeff! You all right? To my horror, it wasn't some intruder, but rather Miles' best friend, Jeff. And now that I saw his body in the light, I realized he was not naked. He was only wearing a skin-colored costume to give the impression of some crazy, drunk, naked lunatic that broke into our house on the night of New Year's. What the hell is he doing here? It was a freaking prank, Rhonda! I set it up! All of our friends are going to be here soon, and now you just killed a man! Not just any man, my best friend! How the hell was I supposed to know it's your friend? And that it's a stupid prank? No matter how much we argue, what's done cannot be undone. I've killed a man, and guests will be arriving at our house soon. The only option we had was to hide his body. It felt awful, but we dug a hole in our backyard and buried Jeff in it. We then covered the surface with snow so that no one noticed. Jeff's car was parked at some distance, and we drove to a frozen lake in the woods and pushed it in. The weight of the car cracked the frozen layer of ice over the lake and drowned into its depth. Miles' friends came and we partied as if nothing happened. People asked about Jeff and we lied that he never arrived here. Everyone left the next day. We wanted to leave too but decided to stay for a day more just to make sure there was no clue left of this unfortunate murder. We decided to dig Jeff's body up and burn it so we would never get caught. What we discovered in that process is the ultimate nightmare. Jeff's fingernails were filled with mud, and a few nails were broken, too. He had soil inside his mouth and nostrils. Oh my god, he tried to come out. He tried to dig the soil. That means... that means... We buried him alive! Back at junior high, I took this ancient history class for some extra credits. 
I was never much of a talker, so I made only one friend in the class. His name was Lucian. One day, our teacher told us that we will be taken on an overnight field trip to a heritage site in the mountains. On a sunny morning, the class of 15 boarded the school bus and started for our destination. As we drove amidst the winding mountain roads, we could sense the weather getting chilly and the surroundings getting spooky. Both sides of the roads were connected to the dense forest, which even in daylight was dark as hell. After driving for an hour straight, the bus driver stopped near a narrow, dusty road. A worn-out signboard was put on the road, reading, The Roaring Silence Wildlife Park. I've never heard such a weird name for a zoo. Our teacher, Miss Mitria, lined us up. Everybody, pay attention. We will see classic examples of Gothic and medieval architecture once we go inside. Stick with the group and do not fool around. We started venturing into the narrow road. There was an abandoned castle with small stone huts. It was a pretty weird zoo. Empty iron cages and stables were scattered around the property. We entered the ruins one by one and found dirty cages filled with garbage and God knows what. There was this big bird cage, which still had feathers and dead bird skeletons lying around the floor. Who on earth wanted to build a zoo like this? Read my mind. The inside of the castle was damp and soggy. A foul stench made the air heavy. Suddenly, we saw this narrow passageway on our right leading to a different section of the castle. Miss Mitria was explaining the architecture with great interest. Taking that window of opportunity, Lucian and I decided to wander around a bit. We took the right passage and walked to the end of it. There was this huge wooden door with a heavy padlock on it. Why is that door closed? I don't know. What do you think's on the other side? Maybe nothing, just old garbage like the rest of this place. Lucian placed his ear on the door. The class had moved to the other wing by then, so it was pin drop silence. The deadness of the environment started to choke me. Hey, we better get back. This place is creeping the hell out of me. Shh, I can hear something. What? Yeah, place your ear on the door. I too placed my ear on the door. There was indeed a heavy breathing sound coming from the other side of the door. Whatever was on that side felt alive and angry. <laughs> what the hell? Lucian screamed, and we both started running. When we joined back our class, we were both panting in fear. Miss Mitria noticed us and said, Where were you two? Um... We, uh, we, we got lost, Miss Mitria. Yeah, we were, uh, we were looking for the bathroom and... We are going to camp nearby and don't you dare sneak into the castle without my permission. You could get lost. Sorry, Miss Mitria. Once everyone started to put up tents for the camp, Lucian pulled me over to a corner and said in a fearful voice, You heard it, right? Yeah, what was that? Some kind of animal? I don't know but we need to find out. You want to go in there again? That too, after dark? Don't you want to find out? This is why we came here, Elias. But if Miss Mitria finds out, she'll... She won't. We will go in after everyone falls asleep. Around 1.30 a.m., we came out of our tent. The night sky was clear with thousands of stars blinking above us. The moon felt bigger and brighter than usual, contributing to the perfect scary setting of this place. Everyone was asleep. Lucian and I took our flashlights and entered the abandoned wildlife park. The castle stood like a haunted mansion. We remembered the suspicious room was on the second floor to our first right. Every footstep we took echoed. When we finally reached the door, I could feel the hair at the back of my neck stood up. Lucian looked at me with nervous eyes and then slowly walked to the door. He took a deep breath and knocked on it. He knocked again. Lucian, I feel like we shouldn't be here, man. Let's go. Maybe... maybe you're right. We turned around to leave, and that's when we heard a distorted human voice calling to us. Help me! Our eyes immediately turned back to the door. Drops of sweat appeared on my forehead. Is there a person behind that door? No, that's enough. We need to leave. Now. What if that man needs our help? I'm going to open the door. I, I must. 
Saying this, Lucian picked up this rock from the ground and started hitting the padlock with it. Stop it, Lucian! Please! But he didn't listen. After five to six hard blows, the padlock broke and the door creaked open just enough to let out a reeking smell of urine and blood peek through. Our eyes were stuck to the door now. We flashed our light slowly on the gap and saw a freaky-looking eye staring at us from the dark. We could also see the partial face of the owner of that eye. His face was wrapped around with bandages like a mummy. Suddenly, the door was pushed wide open and a four-legged man came running at us at full speed. He only had his eyes and thousands and thousands of teeth. I've never seen anything like that. Ah! Run! Run for your life! We started running to the exit while the horrifying humanoid creature chased us, making scary growls. I knew if it gets us, that will be the end, and maybe this sudden panic made my trip. I fell on the concrete floor, screaming, Lucian! Lucian, who was already ahead of me, noticed me lying on the floor. I couldn't get up as I twisted my knee. He came back for me, and just when he was trying to lift me, we heard a gurgling sound, as if a creature from hell breathing near us. We looked to our left, and there it was. Just a few inches distance, the humanoid creature stopped, and then slowly crawled towards us. His wide, toothy mouth opened into a hollow, dark hole, and it brought its face right next to ours. I wanted to close my eyes, but it felt like I forgot how to. The creature stared right into our souls, and then said in its raspy, broken voice, <coughs> you. We then watched it crawl to the nearest window pane and jump from that height. A sound of a thud on the grass took place, and then everything went silent. I can't explain how we got back to our tent. For the rest of the field trip, Lucian and I never talked about this incident. But till today, when I think about it, I feel sick to my stomach. What kind of fracked up zoo keeps a distorted human being? Lucian later gave me this theory that the creature was a real human being put up to disturbing experiments. Years ago, some people tortured humans in the name of science and did all kinds of bizarre things. I still wonder how it survived all those years inside that abandoned castle with no food or water. I'm glad it didn't try to kill us. I'm pretty sure that that creature is now living safely in that mountain forest. What I'm about to tell you begins with the most tragic event of my life. When I was just a child, both of my parents were murdered. A man, out of his mind, came into our house and killed them while I was hiding. But that's another story. During the time when it was being decided who I would live with from then on, I had to stay at my grandfather's house. He was very good to me, but he couldn't be the one to raise me because of his age and illnesses. So, weeks later, I moved in with one of my aunts. I'm so happy to have you here, dear Scott. Come closer. Let me help you with your bags. Thanks, Aunt. I knew she was a good person. My grandfather had even talked to me about it. You know, she was never able to have children. That's why she'll be happy to adopt you. She has good intentions. But, despite everything, there was something strange about her. Something that made me feel uncomfortable every time her small eyes looked at me. There's no better time than Christmas to welcome you to your new home, don't you think? Speaking of which, what do you say about helping me decorate? I know it's a little late at this point, but, you know, I was so busy that I didn't realize. Anyway, we could do it together, as a family? Sure, Aunt Deborah. Oh, but first, go get some rest, my boy. I spent most of the afternoon unpacking my things and resting from time to time, just as she had advised. But as soon as I heard it, I stopped to open my bedroom door. Aunt Deborah, are you okay? Since she didn't answer me, I went downstairs. My aunt was in the living room. I thought you wanted me to help you. She had already decorated the Christmas tree. I was just starting. <laughs> Since you're down here, could you bring me the box I left on the kitchen table? When I got to the kitchen, there was only one box left there. 
It wasn't particularly big, but I can swear it was the heaviest thing I've ever had to carry. I tried to take it to the living room even though it was too much for me, all to help my aunt, but it was a bad choice. Uh... Scott, are you okay? The box, which had fallen just inches from me, was open. Yes, Auntie. I quickly went over to it to close it and pick it back up. Ah! Inside the box were some porcelain dolls. Scott? Oh, my beautiful dolls. I'm sorry. I should have known they were too much for you. My aunt took the box and started to walk back to the living room. Come here, let's see if they're all right. When I got up, my aunt had already taken three of the dolls out of the box. Although they had been carefully dressed, they were still hideous. Their pale gray skin, their eyes, and their mouths gave me the creeps. When I approached to see the fourth, my aunt said, Be careful. I assumed she wanted me to take it out, so I did. It was the worst of them all. Her eyes were bulging and her mouth was open. She looked as if she was going to throw up. Ah! Scott! I'm sorry, it had a buck inside. <sighs> you can go back to your room. I'll try to fix her. After that, I stayed in my room for the rest of the afternoon, as I felt very embarrassed. While drawing, I fell asleep at some point, but I was woken up after nightfall. Soon, I got up and grabbed a pair of pajamas from the closet. Right at that moment, I heard as if something scratched the floor. Huh? Turning around, I saw that the door was slightly open, but since I was still sleepy, I ignored it and just left the room to go to the bathroom. Of course, I put on my pajamas and started brushing my teeth when I heard it. The door had opened. I immediately walked over and took a look at the hallway. Aunt Debra? She wasn't there. I was alone. So I sighed and continued what I was doing. But suddenly, I saw the shower curtain move out of the corner of my eye. As soon as I turned my head to get a better look at it, a horrible screeching sound began. This time, the curtains moved more. Huh? I quickly backed away, but slipped and fell out of the bathroom into the hallway. Pfft, ow! As I opened my eyes, I felt something touch my hand. <laughs> so, I pulled it away without hesitation. That's when I managed to see the silhouette of it. A small creature was running down the hall and the stairs while taking my toothbrush. I soon started to follow the thing without even thinking about it, but once I was on the first floor, I regretted it. Everything was too dark, and I don't remember where the button to turn on the light was, so I started to touch the wall to find it. <laughs> But that constant sound kept making me nervous. Suddenly, I felt something sharp scratch my leg. Ah! I remember almost crying with joy the instant I found the button and the light came on. But when I turned around, my happiness vanished. There, next to the porcelain dolls under the Christmas tree, was my toothbrush. No. My first instinct was to back away. But as soon as I saw a bug pop out of the empty socket of the middle doll, I ran to my room. I'm sorry, I'm sorry! When I closed my bedroom door and jumped into my bed, I was able to stop holding my breath. But soon, I heard it again. <laughs> I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to hurt your friend. <sighs> Since the sound suddenly stopped, I assumed they'd accepted my apology. Thank. Ah! Suddenly, whatever was chasing me was there, scratching me. <laughs> they weren't porcelain dolls, but little green creatures whose nails and fangs were as sharp as blades. Get away! Stop! I tried to push them away, but each time they dug their nails into my skin to hold on to me. Leave me alone! They didn't stop. On the contrary, they started to pull out my hair and even managed to remove a tooth. Ah! That's when I passed out. The next morning, my Aunt Deborah found me badly hurt. She, almost in a nervous breakdown, soon called the police and an ambulance. They all helped and were very nice to me, but they didn't believe what I told them. In fact, 
mentioning the goblins only made it worse since they thought I made it up to cope with the trauma, but I know that what I saw was real. That year I spent Christmas with my grandfather. They gave me many gifts, but all I wanted was the locks of hair and the tooth that were never found. Hey guys, my name's Sid. If you lived in my neighborhood when I was a kid, you might know me as the bad boy. The one who wore a skull t-shirt and the one with the ferocious killer dog. But all stories have two versions. Only no one ever wanted to hear mine. Actually, I was always a very good boy. Yes, I always fought with my sister, sometimes threw tantrums in the street. But what kid doesn't do that? My t-shirt was because I liked rock music, and my haircut was because my family didn't have money to send me to a hairdresser, so they cut it for me. People at school treated me very badly because of my appearance. It was like they were afraid of me. I tried to make friends many times, but everyone always stayed away from me. Luckily, I had one best friend who never judged me, and was always by my side. My dog. My parents were hardly ever in the house, so Scud was the only one who kept me company every day. Anyway, he had a good time at my house. I always played with my toys. When I grew up, I wanted to be a doctor, so I used to do surgeries with my toys, fusing them and experimenting with them. I felt pity when I broke them, but once my mom told me that they don't feel pain, so from that day on I didn't mind breaking them since that would be a good excuse to try to repair them. Despite my family's situation, everything was going very well. But one fateful day, everything would change. One day, I was with a new toy I had found. It was a Buzz Lightyear, just like the one on TV. I was ready to launch it into space where it belonged, but something incredible happened. The toys in my house came to life. They were everywhere. In the mud, in the sandbox... They were all getting up and walking towards me, like zombies. At that moment, Woody, another one of my new toys, stared at me with a terrified look on his face and told me that toys have lives and that if I ever hurt them again, they'll kill me. I never saw Buzz or Woody again, but from that day on, I'm terrified of toys, and they know it. From that day on, being in my house became a nightmare. Every time I went into my room, all my toys were arranged differently. I tried to throw them away, but they always came back. Sometimes they'd be waiting for me perfectly arranged with signs telling me to play with them. Crying, I obeyed them. Who knows what would happen to me if I didn't. Anyway, I didn't even pay attention to them. In any case, not even listening to them and everything they asked me to do would prevent what happened on the worst night... The night I was almost killed. That night, I had gone to bed very early, as we had an evaluation and I was fatigued. I fell asleep almost instantly, and although I thought I would wake up many hours later, a few minutes later, I was already with my eyes open. What? What's happening? They were my three toys, Babyface, Legs, and Ducky. The last one had a piece of paper cut in its hand which had written on it. You are not playing with us anymore. I'm... I'm sorry. I promise I'll do it more often. Why do we always have to ask you? Please, don't hurt me. I'm really trying my best. You've been a very bad boy, Sid. Now, we'll have to hurt you. No, please, no. I'll do anything you ask. Don't do anything to me. Ignoring my words... Ducky grabbed one of my eyelids with its huge toy hands and lifted it up, to which Legs, who climbed up to my forehead, used its fishing rod to catch it and leave it open. Luckily for me, its hook was made of plastic, so it didn't hurt, but that wasn't its purpose. Other toys began to climb up on my belly with a small mirror, and at the command of Babyface's paws, they put it near my eye. I didn't understand what they were doing, but when I saw them carefully arrange it, I understood everything. Ah! Help! My eyes! It burns! After several seconds of screaming and pain, they did the same to the other eye. After a few seconds, they stopped. My eye felt like it was burning, 
I couldn't see anything at all. When they stopped, I felt something strange. While I was screaming, toy soldiers came into my mouth. I tried to close it, but Babyface used its claws to leave it open, while with its head it mocked me. Already inside my mouth, a few soldiers ran towards my throat. I started. Were they trying to kill me? Had I hurt them so much that they hated me so much? I felt like fainting, but hearing all the screams... And to my rescue, my dog ran into my bed, and when it jumped on top of me to attack the toys as it always does, the bed gave up and broke, allowing me to break free. I coughed up all the soldiers and desperately ran out of my room, but I still couldn't see anything. I crashed into everything in front of me until, as soon as I managed to get out of the room, I fell down the stairs. Already on the floor, I felt that my body was not reacting. I couldn't feel my arms or my legs. Possibly I had broken them. I opened my eyes slowly, trying to clear my vision. Babyface was in my face, looking at me with that terrifying baby smile. I felt his paws sinking into my nostrils, squeezing harder and harder inside. I wanted to scream. I wanted to call for help, but I was so shocked. I could only watch with my eyes wide open. With no one to save me, assuming Babyface was going to bury its claws all the way into my brain, the toy simply stopped. We will kill your sister. We will kill your family. We will kill your dog. Play with us. With that said, the toy simply fell to the floor as if it had no life. Behind me, I heard two worried voices. Sid, what happened to you? Son, are you okay? It was my parents. Both of them had brought my sister from a friend's house. Damn it, son, look at your shoulder. You've dislocated it. Confused, I couldn't answer anything. I just looked at them, and crying, I hugged them. Wow, you really got hit hard, didn't you? When we went to the hospital, they only told me I had a dislocated arm and some bruises. When I got home, I went to my room. All the toys were leaning on the bed with a sign that said, We love you, Sid. It took me days to see well again, and I still don't think part of my eyes ever healed. From that day on, I played with my toys every day until the day I moved out of my house. All of my aspirations of becoming a doctor vanished. Today, I work as a garbage collector. I enjoy my job, but every once in a while, when I throw everything in the dumpster, sometimes I see toys in the garbage, and I swear they're looking at me too. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the video. If so, please leave a like. And also, a small percentage of people that watch my videos are actually subscribed. If you want to support this channel and make this channel reach the 1 million mark, please consider subscribing. It's free, and you can change your mind later. Enjoy. Andy's best friend in the Toy Story movies is his cowboy doll Woody, but a theory posits that Woody first belonged to Andy's absent father. Being one of the most discussed conspiracy theories, many fans came up with various interpretations of this. Some say Woody himself was Andy's father, and somehow his dead father remained alive through his childhood doll, but Toy Story never directly addressed the big question. What exactly happened to Andy's father? Did he die? Did he and Andy's mom get a divorce? The story you're about to see is a spin-off sequel created by IMR, just for your entertainment. Being one of the biggest fans of the Toy Story franchise, IMR took the liberty to produce the comic storyline with a creative dark turn. Hope you all will enjoy it. Ah! Where the hell is my beer? I asked for it an hour ago! Get it yourself. Andy? Andy! Where is that stupid boy? Always keeping his toys scattered around the floor? Andy! I casually walked downstairs. This was something new for me. Since my mom married her abusive boyfriend, our lives had finally become completely unbearable. Frank's abuses have two levels. At first, he abuses alcohol, and then he abuses us. Pretty simple, but highly effective. As I came downstairs, I saw my mom staring at me with utmost annoyance and anger. 
How many times do I have to tell you to throw out this old junk? One day, it's gonna ruin our lives. She has always been so dramatic about everything. I kept quiet like I do these days and started picking up my toys into a cardboard box. Frank stormed to the fridge to get himself a beer while my mom went to the kitchen cursing her life. On his way back to the porch, Frank stopped beside me. I was about to pick up the last toy, and he happily put his huge feet on my hand. <laughs> Look at you. Filthy, measurable squint. It was painful, but I kept quiet like I do these days. After a few seconds, he let go and went back to his dirty, fart-smelling couch, back to watching TV. I grabbed the box filled with toys and came back to my room. I opened my closet to keep the toys. I was almost done putting all of them when I found a Sheriff Cowboy toy. I had no idea how it ended up in my box, so I picked it up and pulled the string attached to its back. Giddy up, partner! Wow, it talks. I pulled the string a few more times and it said a bunch of catchphrases like, Reach for the sky! You're my favorite deputy! The toy's clothes were old and had dirt on them. I took it to the bathroom and cleaned its shirt. I slept hugging it that night. For the first time in a while, I missed my dad. I hardly think about him. He died when I was a little kid. Tears rolled down my eyes as I thought about him. I looked at the cowboy doll. I wish you could come alive. It was probably around 1 a.m. when I woke up hearing my mom's painful sobbing. No, Frank, please. Just leave me, okay? I don't want to be with you anymore. I realized drunk Frank is again beating my mom. I came downstairs and found my mom on the ground. Her lips were bleeding, probably from a punch or a slap, and Frank was standing next to her with his leather belt in one hand. Leave you? After how you ruined my life? You said your husband left tons of money for us! That's why I came here! And now you tell me all that money belongs to your little piglet, son? You witch! I'll... Don't you dare touch my mom, Frank! My, my! The little piglet talked! <laughs> now I will skin both of you alive! Saying this, he snapped the belt in my direction and just then an unexpected sound took place. There's a snake in my boot! What the hell is this? I don't know how my cowboy doll ended up on the living room floor. Frank's accidental stepping over him made it talk. Ah, what a hecked up family is this? He raised his leg to stomp on my doll in anger. I lunged at him, screaming. No! Leave him alone! But he pushed me away and I fell on the floor. Frank then went on stomping over the doll and screaming in joy. <laughs> there goes your ragged puppet! I'll do the same thing to you too! The doll was getting smashed, but then suddenly Frank stopped. He grabbed his chest and fell on the floor like he was having a heart attack. No! Frank! My mom screamed. Frank's body started shaking and his skin swelled up. Thousands of blisters started popping on his face, arms, every inch of his body. He looked like a man built with transparent water balloons. Slowly, he blew up into a big barrage balloon. In a choked up dying voice, he said, What's happening to me? And then a loud sound of pop took place. Frank popped and his skin fell on the floor along with his clothes. My mom and I were too stunned to speak. What did you do to him, Andy? What? I didn't do anything. What are you saying? Where did you find this doll? I remember burning it with the other stuff. What other stuff? What are you saying? This can't be. This isn't possible. He's dead. I saw my mom turning hysteric. I was shocked to see that the doll's appearance scared her more than what just happened to Frank. Her words made no sense. I couldn't take it anymore. I screamed. Please tell me what's going on here! You're being crazy! It belonged to your dad, okay? Happy? I couldn't bear the sight of his things. They all reminded me of your father, Andy. 
So I burned them. I burnt everything that belonged to your dad. And I burned Woody too. Then how the hell is he back? Dad called him Woody? I will burn this again. Yes, right now. But before she could, Frank's leftovers started moving. Something was under all that skin and clothes. The pile started to rise like a wave on the ocean. Slowly, a skinny pair of legs wearing boots peeked out from that pile. One by one, the hands, the upper torso, and a face with a sheriff hat on it hovered from that pile. My small cowboy doll, Woody, was now standing in front of our eyes in his human size. A sick smile was lurking on his face. He looked my mom in the eye and said, Being there for a child is the most noble thing a toy can do. Oh my god, this isn't real. <laughs> This is the perfect time to panic. And he picked up Frank's belt and started chasing my mom around the house. Time to straighten things up. Ah! My mom ran to save her life and Woody didn't let her breathe for one second. There came a point when she collapsed on the ground and started panting. And the final truth came out of her mouth. I'm sorry, okay? I, I admit it. I killed him. <sighs> Yes, it was me. I poisoned him every single day for his money. But please, please let me go. You killed my dad? You killed that one person who loved me? Fury and heartbreak took over me. I looked at Woody. He had the biggest grin ever. He slowly walked up to my mom and then gave her a tight hug. He hugged her so tight that my mom's face smashed like a jelly bean. But instead of blood or fluid, cotton balls came out of her mouth. Strings of thread rolled down from her eyes. And then, an explosion of puffy cotton balls took place, leaving her skin and clothes on the ground. Like Frank, she was gone too. I finally have peace in my life now. Woody and his new girlfriend take good care of me. We call her Bo Peep. Both of them look odd in their human-sized physic, but I don't ever want to be away from them. It's like having my perfect parents again. Over the years, the Toy Story franchise has been subject to all manner of fan theories. From how the toys are living creatures, to Andy's mother being the real villain. A reoccurring theme throughout the Toy Story movies is the toy's fear of not being loved or played with. Based on that note, some fans even claim that the toys from Toy Story are vampires, and they are immortal. To succumb to their immortal life, the toys feed on children's joy instead of blood. And maybe because Andy's mother could sense this evil intention among the toys, she was so adamant to get rid of them. However, these are just theories developed by fans. IMR Scary Tales thought to go creative by giving this theory a dark yet entertaining touch. Enjoy. My daughter Chrissy used to be a huge fan of Toy Story when she was five years old. She was obsessed with the weird mutant toys, and among them, the baby face was her favorite. As creepy as it sounds, it was true. Kids sometimes fancy weird things that make no sense to grown-ups. She would beg me to buy her the baby face toy, but I didn't because of its scary attire. One day, I was cleaning the house when I heard my husband talking to Chrissy in a hush-hush voice. Now, don't tell mom, okay? She would be angry if she knew I made this for you. I love you, Dad. This is exactly what I wanted. I went to Chrissy's room and saw my husband, Daniel, giving a box to Chrissy. What are you guys up to? What's in that box, Daniel? Um, nothing. Chrissy came running up to me and said, Dad made me the baby face toy. Please, mommy, can I keep it? Please. I opened the box and saw my nightmare turned into reality. Daniel is an engineer, and somehow he has built the creepy baby face toy from Toy Story for our daughter. He let out an awkward chuckle and said, <laughs> Chrissy's been asking for it for a long time, Mindy. It's just a toy after all. But how come this doesn't freak out you guys? I don't think any kid should play with something like this. But mommy, it walks! Chrissy placed the toy on the floor and turned on a small switch at the back of his bulbous head. Balancing on its metallic spider legs, 
The head of another broken doll started walking all over Chrissy's room. God, this looks sick. Come on, Mindy, you're overreacting now. What harm can come from playing with a toy? Fine, you can keep it. Oh, my sweet mummy. Chrissy hugged me and got super excited about finally having the toy of her dreams. The entire day, Chrissy didn't let Babyface go out of her sight. Even at the dinner table, I had to tolerate that creepy doll staring at me. After dinner, I got busy doing the dishes and cleaning the kitchen. The house was in deep silence as everyone slept in their rooms. Before going to bed, I thought of checking on my daughter. I walked into her room, trying my best not to wake her up. Chrissy was sleeping like a little lamb, and beside her laid Babyface. With one broken eye and its outrageous metallic legs, this was my chance. I picked it up to throw it in the bin, and to my surprise, Chrissy opened her eyes. What are you doing with Babyface? Um, nothing, just keeping it on the shelf. You lie! You were gonna throw him away! No, why would you think that, Chrissy? He just told me. He heard your heart. A cold shiver ran down my spine. Just then, I felt a sharp pain on my finger like a giant bee stung me, and I dropped the toy on the floor. You've made him angry. Now, he is going to punish you, mummy. What? What are you... Suddenly, a sound of crackling bones shifted my attention from Chrissy to Babyface. The toy was now standing on its spidey legs and looking at me with a creepy smile. I could see the evil in its eye. Within a second, it started to crawl at me at full speed. It jumped on me, and I screamed and kicked it with all of my strength. The toy flew in the air for a moment and hit the wall. Its creepy metal legs broke like shattered glass and I sat down on the floor. I was panting. I thought, finally it was over. The damned cursed toy is dead now. But my relief didn't last long. As soon as the toy broke, something horrible happened. Thousands of small baby-faced toys started coming out of its big bulbous head. Yes, an army of baby faces filled Chrissy's room. <laughs> Get mommy, go. Get her. Chrissy started clapping and laughing, seeing these monsters attack me. Before I could get up and run, they were all over my body like a herd of spiders. They were crawling everywhere. On my hands, my legs, my hair, my face, even got inside my clothes. Their tiny metal legs pierced through my skin. I was getting injected with a thousand needles at the same time. Ah, save me! Save me! Daniel! Help me! Ah! No matter how hard I tried to get the creepy crawlers away from me, more and more of them started coming at me. I thought this was it. I will be eaten alive by these baby faces. Somehow, somehow they all came alive and sensed my hatred for them. Oh God, if I knew how vengeful and dangerous they are, I would have never pissed them off. I would have loved them and feared them just like Chrissy. Please, if I could only have one more chance, I swear I will be their mother too. But I guess it's too late now. I was drowning in a swarm of baby faces. They were laughing like baby vampires. The cuts they made on my body, I could feel them sucking my blood from those wounds. As they drank my blood, their heads turned red. I was in hell and no one came to my rescue. Slowly, the will to live started dying in my heart. <laughs> this is what you deserve, Mommy. This is what happens when you hate Babyface. Chrissy mocked me sitting on her bed. I couldn't believe my daughter was against me. Slowly, her face started changing into the creepy toy my beautiful daughter's head got replaced by the one-eyed, broken doll head. I couldn't take it anymore. Not my daughter! I shook my body with all my strength, and the crawling toys deflected. 
Once I freed myself from their grasp, I lunged at Chrissy, who wasn't my daughter anymore. I grabbed the bulbous head and started smashing it into the wall. You took my daughter. I will kill you. I will kill you. You cursed doll. This will be the end of you. Die, die, die. I went on smashing the doll's head on the wall. I didn't stop, didn't hesitate, just kept screaming. Die, die, die. Mindy, what did you do? It was Daniel's voice that brought me back to this world. I wanted to tell him, I killed Babyface. We finally got rid of this haunted toy, but then I noticed my hands. To my horror, they were drenched in blood, human blood. As I looked at my daughter's bed, the ground beneath my feet swept away. All hell broke loose. It wasn't a baby face whom I thought I was smashing into the wall. The wall had blood stains, and fresh blood was dripping down it. Chrissy's lifeless little head hung from the edge of the bed, and I realized what the toy made me do. It made me kill my daughter. There were no swarms of small baby faces, as if there never were. Only the baby face toy that my husband made for Chrissy was lying broken in the corner. Oh my god, is that her? Yeah, Mindy William, the mother who smashed her daughter's head to a pulp. Some people say she got possessed by a demon. That's... she's a psycho. She did it with her sane mind. There's no demon behind this crime. The photograph you see in this video is a part of a police file of a mass murderer. During a raid in a forest, a group of policemen found this house and this peculiar sign, when entering it, could not tolerate the horror. At least seven dead bodies of children between the ages of 6 to 17 were seated, without eyes, tongue, or arms. For this reason, the murderer used this peculiar sign, free hugs, as none of the corpses could give them. The story you're about to see is based on this creepy image with one of the most horrifying backstories in the field of true crime. The incident had taken place somewhere back in 2015 while I was still struggling through middle school, trying to adapt to my new surroundings. I made one friend named Cash, who was a popular kid in my class back then. So, my new school announced an overnight field trip to a wildlife area in Wisconsin. We were made to walk through the entire wildlife park while our science teacher explained to us about medicinal plants and various animal species living in that area. There wasn't much to see, though, just hiking trails scattered throughout the woods. After a point, we reached the campground, where the teachers decided to tent for the night. The sun hadn't set yet, so there was still light. I was sitting on a rock watching butterflies flying over a bush when Cash called me. Yo, Miller! Care for a stroll around the woods? I saw he was headed to the woods. I was bored, so I accompanied him. We went towards the opposite direction of the campsite. We took this unknown trail. The trail dipped steeply, taking us down into an unknown direction. Is it safe to wander around like this? Relax. Everything will be fine. As we walked further, I began to grow uneasy. Everything about the trail felt like I was straying into some foreign place and I was no longer so confident of where I was. I felt like we were losing ourselves in the forest with every step. It was the trees. The trees changed. The maple and oak trees that dominated the park dwindled as we descended, replaced by an old pine forest. The underbrush vanished. The forest floor was an open carpet of pine needles. There were few birds and fewer animals, and the wind was little too chilly. I felt like we were intruding as the silence encased us. What is that? Cash pointed to the tree and I too saw a small stone structure standing behind it. We increased our pace and reached near it. It was a small hut-like room made with stones that were now covered in moss and weed. And on its entry wall remained a graffiti reading free hugs followed by an arrow gesturing inside the hut. What the hell is this place? You want to go in there? For free hugs? <laughs> Not funny, Cash. 
We started checking out the hut from outside. Honestly, it was so dark that never in my life I was going to get in. What do you think happened in here? I don't know and I don't want to find out. Cash took out his phone, turned on the flashlight and said, let's go in. What? Are you crazy? Come on, there's obviously no one inside. Without waiting for my reply, Cash stepped into the abandoned freaky looking hut and disappeared into the darkness. I could hear his footsteps. What do you see in there? A bunch of garbage. Wait, what is that? What? Cash, is everything all right? I felt goosebumps for not hearing Cash's voice anymore. Did he get into trouble? Did something happen to him? I turned the flashlight on my phone and went to check. Believe me when I say this, I was engulfed by the darkness the moment I stepped in. As my light flashed on the ground, I saw piles of kids' clothes scattered like rags. Cash was standing in the corner, staring at something. There was an acute fear on his face. Cash? What's wrong? He didn't say anything, just raised his shaking hand and pointed to a pile of white dust. At first glance, I mistook the pile as a heap of sand, but once I looked closely, I saw thousands of human bones kept in the corner. The bones were smaller, which indicated they belonged to kids. But that wasn't the only thing that we found in there. As we turned our eyes to the wall, our stomachs dropped. The walls were decorated with Polaroid pictures of kids sitting inside this abandoned hut. Not one of the kids had eyes or arms. There were probably eight to ten pictures put up like a disturbing art exhibition. Under each photo, the name of those kids was written. Oh my god, this is why it's named Free Hugs? Cash ran out and started vomiting. My head was throbbing with horror because I too have understood the sick irony behind the graffiti on the outside wall. Free hugs. So these kids were left with no hands or eyes so they can't refuse a hug? What kind of sick psycho did this to those poor children? I came out yelling, Cash, we need to tell the... But where was Cash? I found myself standing in the woods all alone. Cash? Cash? I called out his name, but no reply came. Suddenly, I heard a choking sound coming from distance. I figured out it was from behind the hut. I slowly walked to the backside, and what I saw still scares me to sleep. A woman, barely human, I should say. She looked a thousand years old. Her skin was all sagging, with cheekbones gushing out like mountaintops. She had no flesh under her skin. Her body was skinnier than a twig. She was sitting on the grass and licking the edge of a stone dipped in thick, fresh blood. And in front of her laid my unconscious friend, Cash, with a deep wound at the back of his head. I made a gasping sound, seeing the woman slowly licking the blood off the stone with which she had knocked Cash a few moments back. Her tongue turned red with every single lick. There was a sick pleasure in her eyes as she tasted the blood in her mouth. Miller! Cash! Just then, I heard the voice of our teacher calling our names, and the woman sitting on the ground noticed me. I will never forget her stare. She let out a chuckle and said, <laughs> You two are lucky that I have no more camera reels left. And disappeared into the woods. Our teacher carried Cash back to the campsite, where everybody else got notified about this sudden accident. Our principal called the local cops and I told them everything I saw in the woods. The free hugs hut, the woman, everything. The area turned into a crime scene within the next 24 hours, and we were escorted back to the town after the cops took over. It's been nearly a decade now, and the place is still in police record along with its evidence and human remains. As per police investigation, the bones they found inside the hut could identify eight bodies, but going through the Polaroid pictures, the rest of the kids' bodies are still missing. They searched the entire forest thrice, but never found that woman. The year was 2017, and like every holiday season, I was sitting in a mall all decked up in my red and white Santa attire. 
The white bushy beard had made me sneeze thrice already. Kids were coming up to me with their highly imaginative Christmas lists and taking pictures with me. The parents gathered around and watched their kids with joy. This one toddler came and I suppose it was his first time meeting or even seeing Santa Claus. As I took him on my lap, he stared at my big white beard and then peed himself out of fear. I felt an unnatural warmth running down my leg. I lifted the boy under the armpits, set him on his feet next to the chair, and stood up. He started crying, realizing that he had wet himself in front of Santa Claus. His blonde mom came and took him away. I was thinking to go out for a smoke when someone yelled, Santa! Santa, I want to click a picture with you! I turned around and saw a man in his late 40s standing in the crowd, staring at me with a weird smile and jolly eyes. Grown-ups, too, take pictures with me, so I didn't hesitate and said, Sure, come. I sat down again and he walked up to me. I was adjusting my fake beard when the man sat down on my lap like it was a very normal thing to do. Hey, what are you doing? What? This is how people take pictures with you. No, that's just kids. Get up. But surprisingly, he didn't get up and took out a Polaroid camera from his pocket and said, Can you please look at the camera and smile for me, Santa? Excuse me, but you need to get up from my lap. I had to scream because the man wasn't getting it. All the people in the mall looked at us and noticed the tension. The man chuckled creepily and said, (laughs) Don't worry, I'm not going to pee on your lap. Let's take the picture, okay? Be a nice Santa now. I was stunned by his behavior. He was a second away from taking the photo when I pushed him hard and he fell to the floor. He broke a tooth and I saw it roll away, sprinkling blood on the white mall floor. I got up thinking he will come at me now and prepared myself for a big chaotic fight. But the man didn't do any of that. He stood back, looked at me, and then smiled, flashing his hurt jaw with a missing tooth. His smile was sinister. This isn't over yet, Santa. And he walked away. I stayed in the mall for another three hours but didn't see the man around. Finally, the session ended, and I changed into my regular clothes to head home. I lived nearby and wanted to save the money for the bus, so I decided to walk home. The streets were almost empty. A thick layer of snow and chilling cold made smoke come out of my mouth every time I breathed. I reached home without any trouble and was unlocking the door when I felt someone was watching me. I turned around and saw nothing but the tall street light standing across the street. Man, I'm tired. I went inside and closed the door. There was some leftover lasagna from last night. I tossed the food in the oven to warm up and went to take a shower. Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. When I came out of the bathroom, I heard the oven beep. Ugh, food, here I come. I changed into my pajamas and stepped into the kitchen to finally eat. As I opened the oven lid, I almost got a heart attack. What the? Somebody had placed a dead rat over my lasagna, and the heat squished it into a blobby ball of flesh, fur, and filthy liquid dripping all over the lasagna. Hello, Santa. I recognized the voice, and a cold shiver ran down my spine as I slowly moved my head towards the source of the voice. It was that crazy dude from the mall. He smirked as our eyes met. He was standing in my house. I wanted to punch myself for not closing the main door. Did you miss me? Because I can tell you did. I missed you too, Santa. Take me in your lap, please. Saying this, he started dancing and singing the same song, which I was singing in the shower. Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. (laughs) Isn't that what you were singing? So, that means... Yep, I was watching you. (laughs) You want to know a secret? Saying this, he licked his lips and added, I liked what I saw in there. (laughs) 
I realized this man was a nut job. I quickly went to grab the kitchen knife for my defense from this freak, but found it missing. Oh, are you looking for this? The freak already took the knife. What do you want? I already told you that before! I wanted to sit on your lap, but you pushed me! Do you have any idea how tough it is to get Santa's attention when you grow up? Do you? But I I'm not the real Santa Claus, you know? Shut up! You're as real as me! And you'll take me onto your lap, and then I will curve this big forever smile on your face so we can take a picture to remember! He lunged at me with a knife, but I moved and he missed. His bobbing head hit the kitchen slab, and I heard a skull cracking sound. Even though he hit his head, he did not let out a single scream. Rather, got up with a huge bump on his forehead and began coming at me with the knife again. I quickly got into my room and locked the door. Get the hell away from my house or I'm calling the cops, psycho! Come on, just one picture. I wouldn't kill you. Just one picture, Santa. I'm dialing 911 now! Ah! Why can't you let me have my moment? It's Christmas! But I was done with his bullshit. I told the 911 operator about this home intrusion and waited for the cops to arrive. The man pleaded and banged and kicked on my door for the next 10 minutes. When he realized he can't get in, he stopped. Everything went silent. I slowly walked to the door and placed my ear on it to hear his footsteps. <laughs> Did I get you, Santa? That's when I heard the cop siren in distance. Fine, I will leave. Hope I can get my picture next year. Merry Christmas. I sat on the floor. My heart was beating like a wild horse. His footsteps finally faded away. Though I reported this guy to the cops, he was never caught. I changed my address and definitely not taking up the dressing up Santa job this year. My name is Trevor, and I'm the kind of dad that kids call a grumpy guy. It's not because I don't like to have fun, I'm just a very protective father. Normally, my wife tells me to relax a little, that the kids are growing up and being careful, but especially in the new year, something inside me wakes up, and I feel like I have to keep an eye on them. I can understand that they think I'm crazy, maybe, like everyone else. I have some degree of insanity. But if you knew what my madness is about, as well as my family, you would understand me too. It all started more than 30 years ago. I have no siblings, so I was always very spoiled. My parents treated me very well, but I still had the fantasy of running away, of living an adventure on my own. I had a lot of energy and felt that my destiny could not be in a small town, even though I was not even 12 years old. I had to live life to the fullest. My experiment came to a head on New Year's Eve. My whole family was partying while I was sleeping. That was the chance to escape. While everyone was in the dining room, I opened the window and without grabbing anything, I left. Sorry, Mom. Sorry, Dad. But I can't be a kid forever. I walked forward again, thinking about where to go. The first thing I needed to do was to get out of town and go into the wilderness. Luckily, we were surrounded by a forest, so it wouldn't be too difficult to find it. I walked a few blocks, but something in front of me prevented me from passing. A shadowy silhouette stood in the darkness. His eyes were blood red, and his huge figure was imposing. The figure came out of the shadows, and luckily it wasn't a monster, but by its face it could easily be one. Hey, kid, what are you doing outside your house? The man looked nervous, but he had a huge smile on his face. All his clothes and face were covered with blood, but he didn't have any wounds. I know this was weird, but if I was going to run away, I had to be brave and not be afraid of anything. Or at least, that's what I thought when I was a kid. I'm running away. I've decided I want to live in nature. Oh, I see... And where are mom and dad? Are you deaf? They're at home. I ran away. How brave you are, child. 
As he spoke to me, I could see the drool coming out of his mouth, as if he couldn't wait to do something. Before I could answer him, his eyes popped out of their sockets, and he looked up at the sky. Desperate, he shouted violently, No! You won't take him away from me! You can't keep him! He's just a child, for God's sake! Sir, are are you all right? I won't let you take him away! Don't you see how brave he is? Ah! I wasn't going to witness another second of whatever that was. I ran as fast as I could. I didn't know who that man was, but he was going to hurt me for sure. As I ran, I heard two voices behind me, but they both came from the same person. Run faster! Get him! This was not the same voice as before. His tone was much thicker and full of anger. All right, but promise me you won't hurt him. I want his eyes to be the first thing I see when the new year starts. I was still far away, but the man with two voices was catching up with me. There was no way I was going to make it home in time. I turned quickly to miss him and went in the direction of the park. It was only a few minutes before New Year's. If I could hide long enough, people would come out of their houses to celebrate, and this man would not be able to catch me. I climbed up the stairs to the slide and hid inside it, without going down. After a few seconds, I heard his voice again, walking around the park. Boy, relax. You can come out now. The bad man promised me he wouldn't kill you. He's not hungry anymore. I covered my mouth. If I made the slightest sound, he would surely find me. You don't believe me, do you? Trust me, the bad man only eats human flesh before the new year. But he just ate. He's satisfied. He said I could stay with you if I promised to take care of you. Isn't that great? You are mine, little lamb. No, get away! The man quickly climbed up the slide, and before I could muster the strength to pull myself up, he grabbed my leg with his teeth and, like a dog, yanked me down. Already in front of me, he lunged towards my face, trembling. Suddenly, his expression changed again. No! You promised me you wouldn't eat him! It's mine! The man grabbed me with both arms and, lifting me up, started to run. I tried to bite him, scratch him, hit him, but nothing seemed to work. It was as if I was invulnerable to pain. After running a few blocks, he opened the trunk of his car with one hand. As I tried to throw myself into the trunk, I saw a family coming out of their house celebrating. It was already New Year's Eve. All the doors began to open, and the man started to get nervous. I had to take advantage of this opportunity. Help! We're being kidnapped! My scream seemed to have scared the man as he nervously let go of me as all the families turned to look at us. I had made it. I was escaping. Suddenly, my happiness was interrupted. It was the man again, grabbing me by the head with enormous force. You scared Jeffrey, you damn brat! With great force, he threw me into the back of the car and slammed it shut. I began to hear the screams of the families running in my direction, but when they were very close, the car started up. The screams were heard farther and farther away, until they disappeared. After that, the only thing I remember is waking up in a cage in a basement. There was a smell of blood that made me sick. When the lights came on and my eyes adjusted, the scene I saw was a nightmare. There were dead bodies everywhere, blood was everywhere, and in front of me, my captor approached me. Are you going to kill me? No. How do you think I would do that? I've never killed anyone. Only the beast is the one who kills. But don't worry. You're my pet now. He won't do anything to you as long as you behave yourself. Now, eat a little. I have to go. I'll come down to play with you later. 
No, stop! Don't go away! Those were his last words. After that, the man left and I went back to the darkness. During the time I was there, I lived for almost five years in which I never left that basement. All I did was watch the man kill people at night with brutal force, tearing his victims apart with his bare hands. Women, children, old people, men. He made no distinctions. He just brought people in and killed them. During the day, his other personality would come down and play with me. He would throw papers at me, comb my hair, and tell me about his day. When I cried or didn't want to answer him, well, he would punish me. New Year's Eves were special. During the day, he would celebrate our birthday together by bringing me chocolate. He didn't need anything. He told me he wanted to save the beast's appetite for the night. When darkness came, he would bring a victim, as usual. Only that, in addition to killing it, he would devour it before the new year. The years continued to pass, until one day I heard loud gunshots from above, and a few minutes later a bunch of men and lights were pointing at me. It was the police. I was saved. I was hospitalized for many days. I had several illnesses and malnutrition problems. My body took months to recover, but my brain hasn't healed quite yet. When I grew up, I was able to have my own family. Today, I'm better, but when I'm with my children, I never lose sight of them. Even though that man died the day the police found me, at the end of the year, I still see him in the window. He's not looking at me, but my children. I know I'm probably crazy and hallucinating, but I will never let him or any other beast put my loved ones through what I went through. I think... I think I'm finally ready to tell you the whole truth today, Doctor. Excellent, Amy. The fact that you're ready to talk about this is the first step towards healing. It's not healing that I need. I'm not crazy, Doctor. That's what... <sighs> they... They want everyone to think. Why don't you tell me everything that happened, Amy? Yes. It all started the night I went with my daughter to my parents' cabin in the woods. Little Kate's father died in a traffic accident when she was still a baby. I was all she had. The little vacation started off well. It was her, me, and nature. But on the first day, everything started to go wrong. I still remember the nightmare I had that night. It was the most real nightmare I'd ever had in my entire life. Today, I still have my doubts whether or not it really happened. I remember that night when I was awakened by a loud noise. When I opened my eyes, I panicked. I was not in my cabin and my daughter was not next to me. I was on an operating table. I wasn't tied up, but my body could not move. Everything around me was pitch black. The walls were black too, but they were not made of concrete. They seemed to be made of a viscous material and they moved. It was as if they had a life of their own. In panic, I tried to move my body around, but I couldn't. Suddenly, there was someone next to me. A black being with gray spots staring at my belly. I ducked my head and that's when it hit me. My organs were outside my body. How was I still alive? How come I didn't feel pain? Nothing made sense. What are you doing? Let me go! Now! Help! Ah! That... It felt... So real. Mom, are you okay? Kate... I'm fine. Mom... You screamed so loud. You scared me. I'm sorry, Kate. Mommy's gonna have some tea. You go back to sleep. No, I want a chocolate milk. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's go to the kitchen. When we got to the kitchen, I saw the table and got confused. There was a strange blue object that I had never seen before. It looked metallic, but at the same time, it didn't look solid. Kate, did you bring that here? I took it out this afternoon when you were unpacking. It was next to the flying saucer. What? 
Yeah, it was in the forest. It looked invisible, but I saw it start to fly. I swear. Why didn't you tell me? Because you were going to get mad at me for going to the woods. You always get mad. Obviously, I didn't believe her, but with the dream I'd had and seeing that strange object I'd found, a part of me got scared. Silently, we took our drinks and went to sleep. No. No. What do you want from me? No. No! Hi, Amy. How are you doing? Oh, hi, Mark. Seriously, you have to stop referencing that movie. I miss when you used to call me dad. Aw, age is taking its toll on you. Just kidding. We're having a good time. We needed a few days in the middle of nowhere to relax a bit. Well, I'm glad to hear it, honey. I just wanted to check in. I'm not going to take up any more of your time. You know you don't. But I have to go cook anyway. Say hi to mom. I didn't want to scare my parents, but I wasn't well. I woke up with more doubt and fear than peace of mind. What was that thing my Kate found in the woods? How come I had such a dream, so real, that I still had the feeling that this black being would appear in front of me? In the story Kate told me yesterday, I didn't believe her, but I decided to investigate the forest just in case. Maybe there was a hidden person or some teenagers camping. I grabbed some pepper spray and went to the location my daughter told me about, but there was nothing. Just an empty forest, no sign that anyone had been there. I was about to go back to the cabin, but something caught my attention. Up ahead, behind a tree, there was some kind of distortion. At first, I walked to see if my eyesight was failing me, but every step I took, I convinced myself that something was wrong. That distortion in the air had a human shape. It was like someone, or something, was camouflaging itself with the rest of the forest. I took out the pepper spray and approached very slowly. With each step I took, I felt that what I saw became more and more real. With each step I took, the silhouette hid more and more behind the tree until it disappeared. I arrived at the tree, and after looking behind it, I was shocked. There was nothing. Terrified, I desperately ran home, crying. Whatever I saw didn't try to chase me. I didn't feel it had any intention of attacking me. I was the one who disturbed it. Did this have anything to do with the dream I had? The only thing I could recognize about him were his eyes. Undoubtedly, they were the same as those of the being I had dreamt about. Interrupting my thoughts, someone knocked violently on the door. Mom! The door! I know, honey. Ugh. Mommy has ears too. Who could be knocking on my door in the cabin, far away from civilization? With the pepper spray ready, I looked through the crack and behind the door. There were two men in black suits standing there, staring at me. As if knowing I was looking at them, one of them spoke to me. FBI, ma'am, open the door. What was the FBI doing here? Was it because of what I found? These men looked strange, but they were definitely human. Maybe they were here to warn me about something. Worried, I opened the door, and without permission, they just walked in and started searching the house. Excuse me. Is something wrong? Have a seat, madam. Answer me honestly. This is very important and your life is at risk if you don't tell me what I want to hear. Do you understand? Yeah, yes. His voice was inflexible. I couldn't understand if I was in danger or if he was the one who was threatening me. How long have you been here? We arrived yesterday afternoon with my daughter. Have you seen anything strange since you got here? No, we're just on vacation. I decided to lie. I was more afraid of these men than whatever I saw in the woods. Are there any criminals hanging around the area? Mommy, I think he means that thing I saw last night. What are you talking about? Oh, nothing. It's just kid stuff. She thinks she saw something in the woods. It was probably a wild animal. No, Mom. I really saw an alien and a huge ship. Kate, don't scare the men with your stories. She always says this. If it were for my daughter, you would have already discovered UFOs, Bigfoot, and a few demons. 
The two men looked at each other and stood up, heading for the door. As they were leaving, one of them turned around. Ma'am, we have to go get something and we'll be back. Don't leave or talk about this to anyone. Do you hear? Yes. Did something happen? I don't want my daughter to get in trouble. Everything she said was the work of her imagination, I swear. Without paying any attention to me, they just left. As soon as they walked through the door, I closed it, terrified. I put up all the bars and fell to the floor, crying. I was so scared. The threats from these men seemed so real. But if I stayed and waited for them, who knows what could happen. Desperate, I called 911 and told them everything that happened. What my daughter saw, the men in black, what happened to me in the woods. I was desperate to talk to someone. I thought the operator was going to get mad at me, but instead, they told me they would send a patrol car to the area. I admit, I found this very strange, but at the same time, it calmed me down. I waited patiently for the police to arrive. When they get here, maybe they could take me to the nearest town. I was afraid to get into my own vehicle. I didn't know if these men were really FBI, but I knew that if they weren't, they would at least respect the cop's badge. I grabbed all of mine and Kate's stuff, and then waited, and waited, and waited, but no one came. Hours passed and still no sign of the police, so I decided to call 911 again. 911, how can I help you? How are you doing? I spoke to you earlier. You can see my number, right? You told me you'd send a police car. Yes, the police officers are on their way. Please, wait with Kate. They'll be there any minute now. Thank you very much. I'm so scared. I just want this to be over. I don't know who those men were. Relax, Amy. Help is on the way. Ma'am, are you there? How did you know my daughter's name is Kate? I beg your pardon? How did you know my daughter's name is Kate? I never told you her name, I just said my daughter. Ma'am, I have a record of all your data here. Don't worry about that. You just assume that because this is my father's house? Without even asking? Answer me! Amy, just stay and wait. Don't compromise me too. Listen to those men. Believe me, you don't want to piss them off. Who the heck are you? I'm a simple 911 operator. I'm not with them, but I'm smart enough to play by their rules. They're listening to us now. I recommend you to cooperate and stop calling us. We have family too. Don't put us at risk. And without another word, the 911 operator hung up on me. Confused, I slowly walked away from the phone, thinking about my few options. What should I do? Run away with my daughter, listen to them. Either option seemed terrible. The flow of my thoughts stopped when the phone began to ring. Hello? Oh, little Amy, you haven't been misbehaving, have you? That was the voice of the man in black who had come earlier, extremely calm and calculating, but threatening. Please, leave me alone. I haven't done anything wrong. I won't tell anyone anything. I'll play by your rules, but please, let us go. It's too late for that, Amy. You lied to us. You've been very bad. I was scared. I'm sorry, please. I want to leave. Don't worry. We lied too. We knew what happened there. We just wanted to have a little interview. What do you mean? You tell me, Amy. Have you been having nightmares? Having trouble sleeping at night? How do you know that? Who the hell are you? Those are common symptoms of all people who have been abducted, Amy. But your case is much more interesting than the rest. You've seen them awake, right? You remember everything, and that helps us. I'll tell you everything I know. Just let my daughter go. You don't have to tell us anything. Believe me, your brain will speak louder than you. And your daughter, little Kate, is also another special case. No! Leave her alone. Unfortunately, we can't do that. She not only saw something that she wasn't supposed to see, but she also came in contact with an artifact that doesn't belong to this world. I said leave her alone. <laughs> Mommy, did something happen to you? Who were you yelling at? I couldn't tell Kate anything that was happening. I didn't even know how. I just hugged her and kept crying. Without giving me time to compose myself, someone tried to open the door. After failing to do so, 
Whoever was behind the door slowly walked to the window. Behind it, the same man as before stared at me with a slight smile. He pointed in the direction of the door so that I would open it for him. You'll never take my daughter. Go away! At my response, the man stopped smiling, and as if disapproving my action, shook his head. After a few seconds, the door exploded and four men came in. Two of them were the ones I had seen before, and two others were in civilian clothes. What I didn't notice before became more evident than ever. These men looked exactly the same. All four were bald. Their bodies, facial expressions, and black glasses were identical. It struck me that only one of them spoke, but at this point, nothing made sense. I ran with Kate to the kitchen and grabbed a knife, waiting for them to come for us. No matter what, I would protect my daughter to the end. What are you going to do to us? We'll do whatever it takes to keep you and your daughter safe. What do I have to be safe from? From yourself. Now, give us the girl. We need to talk a couple of things with her. At this request, all my fear turned into anger, and I released Kate to charge with all of my strength against the men, brandishing with my knife. Without making too much effort, one of the uniformed men stopped me halfway, pulled the knife out of my hand, and punched me in the stomach. Surrendering to the pain, I fell to the ground and began crying. Not because of the blow, but because I knew I had failed as a mother. As I watched my child cry and scream for help while one of the men in black took her, Still not finished with me, the only man in black who talked stared at me and slowly approached. With every step he took, I felt that my life was one notch closer to the end. My muscles tensed to the point where pain raced through my body. I tried to crawl backward, but found myself completely frozen in front of the attacker's polished boots. With a meticulous movement, he crouched down to my height and brought his face within inches of mine. He didn't insult or threat me. He didn't even utter a word, but his scream ran through my whole body and filled me with an indescribable horror. I could perceive how his scream was charged with an unjustified rage while I felt that with every second it lasted, I aged a little more. After a brief moment that seemed to last for hours, it stopped, and as I felt an icy sting in my neck, my vision blurred and I fell asleep. When I opened my eyes, Kate was sitting in front of me, waiting for me to wake up. Unaware that my body was still numb, I fainted halfway through trying to hug her, but she did it for me. Are you okay, Mom? I'm sorry, Kate. What did those men do to you? Are you okay? I'm okay, Mom. They didn't do anything. I told them what I saw and they explained how it was all my imagination. What? They also told me not to tell anyone about this, so we don't scare the rest of the people about something that didn't happen. Kate, all of this did happen. I saw something in the woods. Don't you believe your mom? Mom, you're just nervous. Calm down and you will see that you are exaggerating everything. Yes, you're right. Something was wrong. That person was just like my daughter. She had the same voice, gestures, appearance, everything. But that was not my daughter. You can't fool a mother. I was still very scared, so we just left the place as soon as possible. As soon as I got home, I raised my voice to the world and went to all the newspapers and tabloids with my story, but no one believed me. I thought of using the spherical tool as proof, but to no one's surprise, it disappeared after the men in black entered my house. From that moment on, Every day I went back to my house, I was afraid. As I did everything I could to investigate about those men in black to find my real daughter, I felt watched. The little girl who was with me watched me at all times. Sometimes she would cry for me, worry, and ask me if I was okay, but I knew it was all an act. And why do you think they'd let you live and tell everything you told? They're testing me, doctor. They want to experiment on me. And this is part of the experiment. I still have these nightmares. They're seeing how I react to being abducted, to having had a paranormal contact. (laughs) You think I'm crazy, don't you? No, there's no such diagnosis as crazy, Amy. But we have a long way to go. 
As I finished my session with Amy, I couldn't help but feel a little scared. Her story made no sense, but she told it with a conviction and assurance that in my 40 years of experience as a psychologist, I've never heard of. A few days later, some policemen knocked on my door. They were both bald and had glasses. They came to ask me what I do know about her, claiming that she was missing. Something was wrong. The man was lying, and he didn't even bother to hide it. His questions led me to think that they did know Amy's whereabouts. They just wanted to know how much he knew about her and what he thought about it. That they came dressed just as Amy discovered them may have been a trap to make me nervous, but of course I didn't fall for it. I told them that the fact that she was seeing aliens and men in black coincided with other symptoms and indicated that Amy was suffering from schizophrenia. In addition, everything suggested that she also had Capgras syndrome, which explained her behavior of thinking that her daughter was an imposter. I told them that Amy's behavior was something that could happen in a person who had experienced such a close loss as her husband and still had to care for her daughter. Pleased with my response, the two cops left and I never saw or heard from Amy again. It was as if she had disappeared off the face of the earth. I admit that Amy's case made me very curious and if I thought hard about what she said, I might even believe her but I wasn't going to. I'm a man in my 60s. I have a family and grandchildren to take care of. Even if this girl was telling the truth, why risk it? If the men in black are real, I prefer to play by their rules. Have you ever wondered what's after death? Maybe you think that all your relatives are waiting for you in a magical place. Maybe you believe in reincarnation. Or maybe you think that everything will end, like an eternal blackout. I no longer ask myself this question. I think I've seen what awaits us after death, and I can only tell you, I hope that I'm wrong. I must admit that I was very anxious to know my fortune, especially since I was coming from a job interview. It all started on a Friday, July 22nd. The day was sunny and a younger version of me was going with her boyfriend to a fortune teller, but I was so excited that I couldn't see the car speeding across the street at a red light. What the shit, man? What is your- When I saw the driver, all my anger was instantly gone and replaced by fear. The driver had no face. His head was moving from side to side, impossibly, while a strange liquid was coming out of his forehead. Without hesitation, the driver turned the car back on and simply drove off. Wow, what a jerk. Are you okay, hon? It, yes, I'm just a little shocked. Let's go to the fortune teller. I tried not to wonder what I had seen. I probably imagined it, but from that moment on, I felt something was wrong inside me. And that's it for you, boy. You have a great future ahead of you. You just have to face the loss of a very loved one. <laughs> I don't know whether to be happy or angry. It's your turn, young lady. Yes, sure. Hmm, this is weird. What, my hands are ugly? According to what I see in your hands, you have no future. What is that supposed to mean? Darling, from what I see, you're already dead. Okay, Ryan, we're out. Thanks for everything. No problem, honey. I'm sure we'll see each other soon enough. <laughs> what the heck was that? I guess the lady was a little eccentric? Whatever, let's just go. Several days passed since that afternoon and everything felt weird. I felt physical discomfort all the time, as if my body was rejecting me. I started to get depressed for no reason. I didn't want to leave the house anymore. The following week, I convinced myself to go for groceries. I needed an excuse to get out. That was the worst mistake I could have ever made. 
From the moment I walked out of the street until the moment I came back, people kept staring at me, without speaking to me, without making any expressions, without going on with their lives, people just staring at me. Even the cashier at the supermarket passed my products without speaking to me, with his eyes focused on me. When I was coming back from shopping, it got even worse. People were not only staring at me, but they were also following me. Something was wrong with their faces. They were like those of the driver who almost ran me over a few days before. They were distorted, without shape or facial features. I started to run desperately, but no one was chasing me. They were just looking at me, just walking slowly in my direction. When I reached my apartment, I locked the door and took a deep breath. Whatever had happened, it was over. Ryan, we need to talk. I think I'm freaking out. I approached Ryan, who had his back to me. Without turning around, he started talking to me, but there was something weird about him. His voice seemed distorted. Jacqueline, we need to talk about something. What happened? When I see you every night, I feel the fantasy of choking you in your sleep. Your neck looks so tender and helpless. I feel I could squeeze it, squeeze all the air out of you until your lungs burst. What? Are you out of your mind? Oh, come on. Are you telling me you don't have the same thing going on? There's nothing wrong with admitting it. But that doesn't mean you don't love me. Ryan, you're scaring me. Get away from me. Please, I need to feel your neck. Let me touch it a little. I didn't know what was wrong with Ryan, but at that moment, he was dangerous. I ran away in desperation, trying to unlock the door as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, Ryan was running in my direction, with his hands raised, ready to choke me. When he was only a few inches away from me, I opened the door and exited the room. And that's all I remember of that situation. As if there had been a time jump, when I opened my eyes, I found myself in Fortune Teller's house. In front of me was Ryan, but with a distorted face. The driver I had seen before, and Fortune Teller. Where am I? How did I get here? As she approached me with a syringe in her hand, the fortune teller replied, You're in hell, my dear. I told you, you're dead. What? That's not possible. I'm alive. Oh, yeah? Then what are you doing here? I don't know, but it must be a mistake. I'm alive. I tried to escape. But even though I wasn't tied up, my body didn't respond. Ah! Somebody help me! I'm kidnapped! No one will come to save you here, girl. They all want to hurt you. But how did I get here? I didn't do anything wrong. Why hell? What makes you think there is anything else? It can't be. I can't be dead. Oh, don't waste your tears on this. You have no idea the pain you will suffer for all eternity. What? What is that? What are you going to inject me with? I could tell you, but I don't think there's a word for it. The fortune teller injected me with a syringe in my left eye. A horrendous pain that I could never have imagined ran through my body. It was as if I had been injected with fire. I could feel all the blood rushing through my body, trying to get out. My eyes, my mouth, my heart. I felt like everything was going to explode. The fortune teller looks at her hand, reaches up to ear and whispers. You had a very happy future ahead of you. You were going to be accepted in the job you wanted so much. You are going to have a happy life, but that's all over now. You came here before your time, but I'm going to make sure it's worth it. Jacqueline, you're awake. I'll call a doctor. R Ryan, where am I? Honey, you've been in the hospital for a few days. What? What happened? 
Don't you remember? Some jerk ran you over with his car while we were on our way to see the fortune teller. That bastard hit and ran, but I remember the license plate and the police already caught him. I thought I was dead. Actually, you were. What? The doctors almost didn't save you, Jacqueline. Technically, you were dead for about two seconds. No. But stay calm. You're out of danger now. What's more, yesterday I got a call on your cell phone. It was from the job interview. They accepted you. They even said they'll wait longer for you to get better. <laughs> What's wrong? Jacqueline? Jacqueline? <laughs> I was decorating my Christmas tree when I heard footsteps outside my apartment. I checked through the peephole and saw a girl near my age dragging her heavy suitcase into the opposite apartment. Finally, a neighbor! A joyful smile came to my face knowing I won't be celebrating Christmas alone this year. I opened the door to help the poor girl. Hi, let me help you. No need, I can do it myself. I'm Kathy, your neighbor. And you are? She got in and slammed her door in my face. It felt bad that I was being nice to her and she blew me off. But I don't lose hope so easily. I decided to bake cookies for my neighbor as a housewarming gift. I also thought of inviting her for dinner so we could celebrate the joy of Christmas together. The building I live in has just started to fill up, so most of the apartments are still vacant. On my floor, it was just me. And now this new girl who arrived. After putting the chocolate cookies in the oven, I hung the new blinking Christmas lights all over the living room. The red shiny bell on top of the Christmas tree made it look exclusive. I changed into my cute elf costume and waited for the cookies to get done. Just then, a loud sound of heavy metal music shook the entire building. Realizing it was coming from the new girl's apartment, I heaved a sigh of disappointment. She is going to be a tough nut to crack. With a nervous face, I rang her doorbell. At first, she didn't answer, so I rang again. This time, the loud music stopped and heavy footsteps walked up to the door. What? She opened the door in one strong jolt. Her angry eyes were fixated on me like she wanted me dead. I'm... I made cookies for you. Merry Christmas? Ugh, what is your problem, dude? I just wanted to invite you for dinner. It's Christmas Eve, and we both seem to be alone, so I thought... What? That I will agree to hang out with a skinny witch like you? Do you even understand boundaries, Kathy? Sorry, but I just wanted us to be friends. <laughs> friends? Like, seriously? I don't make friends with people like you. What do you mean by people like me? People who are so stupidly obsessed with Christmas. I mean, it's all fake. There's nothing joyful about it. The world is a dark place and to hell with Santa Claus. You take that back. Huh? Or what? I hate Christmas. I hate Santa. And I hate people like you who try to cover up their shitty lives under the make-believe rug of Christmas joy. I smiled at her. She kept staring at me in reaction, but I spoke in a soft, calm voice. Seems like I have to try the hard way. Whatever. I hit her on the forehead with a candlestick which I hid in my costume. And like a clueless trapped rabbit, she fainted on the floor. I then took a bite of my freshly made chocolate cookies. Mmm, yum, delicious. Let's celebrate Christmas. Within the next few minutes, I dragged my unconscious new neighbor into my apartment, sat her down in a chair facing the Christmas tree, and tied her up with tight rope so she couldn't do anything more stupid. Christmas is all about joy and sharing happiness. I don't know why some people don't understand that. Never mind. I can make them understand pretty well. I roasted the chicken, made mashed potatoes, and my special strawberry cake for dessert. Once I was done preparing the dinner table with delicious food, I went to wake up the poor girl. 
Wake up, pumpkin. It's time to rise and shine. <laughs> uh, where? Come on, wake up. We're going to have so much fun tonight. She finally opened her eyes and for the first time, I was happy to see the fear on her face. What's happening? What are you doing to me? Me? No, no. I'm just trying to get to celebrate Christmas. That's all. Let me go, okay? Or or I'll scream. You can try. Ah! Help me! Somebody! I'm in here, please send help! Fa la 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 la. <laughs> Let me go! Shh! You're screaming for no reason. There's no one here to hear you. <laughs> what do you want? Nothing. I just want to celebrate Christmas. You don't have to be scared of me. I took away the knife because it was surely making the new girl nervous. Let's start again, okay? Hi, I'm Kathy, and you are... Sam. Samantha. Now you're being a good girl. Tears rolled down Sam's beautiful blue eyes. I felt bad, but she left me no choice. Come on, don't cry. You're just trying to make me feel bad. <laughs> Look, I'm not a bad person. I tried to be nice, but you wore your ass as a hat. What else could I have done? You should be lucky that I didn't do what I did to Ramona. Ramona? Wait, isn't... Isn't she the girl who left here before me and left the apartment on the night of Christmas Eve? Nice homework, neighbor. <laughs> but she didn't leave. I made her disappear. Sam's face changed. Her skin turned pale in horror. Her mouth opened in shock. What did you do to her? I made her immortal so she never misses any Christmas with me. Let me go get her to join us. Ramona, Ramona, we have a new friend now. I went to my bedroom and brought out Ramona to the living room for the first time. She was sitting in a wheelchair with her eyes closed. Oh my God, why does she, she, sorry, forgot to tell you. I learned taxidermy from my grandpa. He loves stuffing all the wild animals after hunting them. It's easy, you can do it too. Scraping the fat under the skin, then rub it with borax to help it dry faster. And last but not least, stuff it with lots and lots of cotton and sew it up. <laughs> nice, right? You're a freak! No wonder you're alone! I felt the blood in my veins boil up. Smokes of anger curled up inside my body. I let out a huge grin at Sam. What is it, Ramona? You want Samantha to be like you? Oh, sure. I can do that. It will be your Christmas gift. I turned on the music. The Christmas carols filled the air in the apartment. Sam was screaming, screaming her heart out, but it didn't bother me. I kind of like it when they scream. I started sharpening my tools. The dinner will get cold but I must serve the need of the hour. After all, Ramona asked for her Christmas gift. <laughs> Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. <laughs> <laughs> I had just graduated college, and I needed a small place to stay while I searched for a new job. I worked part-time at a small grocery store, but now that I graduated, it was time to start looking for a better job. Anyways, apartments were way too expensive to rent on my own, so I was mainly looking for places with spare rooms for rent. I knew it would be awkward for a while living in someone else's house, but I didn't have much of a choice to be honest. 
my old roommate from college suggested looking on Craigslist, as most other sites at the time didn't let you post single rooms in a house, or maybe it was just really hard to find them. Either way, Craigslist seemed to have a ton of options to choose from, so I stuck with it. After a few days though, I started to get frustrated as none of the people would reply to my requests, and the ones that did would just apologize and say it was already taken. But then on Saturday morning, a new room popped up. It was nearby, cheap, and looked pretty nice. In the description, a man named Tom was advertising it as a large house with a spare bedroom for rent that also had a separate bathroom and closet. This sounded perfect to me, so I emailed him about my interest and then went to work. I knew the listing had just been posted that morning, so I felt confident that I was the first one to contact him. On my lunch break, I checked my emails and Tom had replied, asking me to come and view it that afternoon. I knew I'd be tired after work, but I also really wanted this place, so I agreed and we set a time. After work, I drove straight there, which was only about 10 minutes. From the outside, the house looked really nice. It honestly just looked like a regular medium-sized neighborhood home. I parked on the side of the road and walked up to the door, then lightly knocked. After 30 seconds, I knocked again, a little bit harder this time. A minute later, I pulled my phone out to text Tom, but just before I sent it, he opened the door and invited me in. I immediately noticed he was sweating a lot, as if he had just finished a long workout, and he smelled awful. I didn't want to be rude or anything, so I just ignored it. He began walking me around the ground level floor, showing me the kitchen and the living room. He mentioned that he didn't use these rooms often, so I wouldn't have to worry about getting in his way. From the look of the rooms though, it seemed as though he used them too often. Old dishes were piled up in the sink and the couch had stains all over it. I really didn't like how dirty the whole place was, and it was strange that in the pictures it looked like the house was really clean. One thing I remembered specifically was that the living room had a brown leather couch in the picture, but the couch that was actually there was black. I figured Tom had probably used the pictures of the house from years ago before it sold. I was a bit annoyed at the dishonesty of it, but all that really mattered was my room, which was upstairs. Tom led the way to the stairs, then stopped when he reached the bottom of the steps and held his hand out in a gesturing manner as if he wanted me to head up first. I got a weird and uncomfortable feeling as I started up the stairs, as Tom didn't follow me. He stayed at the bottom and smiled, saying that my room would be the first one on the left. I continued to the top and took a couple steps into the hallway before a soft thud came from behind the door to what was said to be my room. I looked back down the stairs at Tom, whose smile was now completely gone. Uh, does someone else live here? He replied in an annoyed tone, telling me that it was just one of his friends staying the night and not to worry about it, then urged me to check out the room for myself as he was sure that I'd like it. I was definitely pretty nervous at this point, scared even. Why wouldn't he have told me that someone else was here? It seemed like something that I should know. Everything started adding up, and all I wanted was to get out of there right away. I tried to act confident and began walking down the stairs as I explained that the place wasn't going to work out for me. He didn't seem to like that answer, and he moved his body to block most of the bottom of the stairs. I stood a couple steps away and firmly told him that I needed to leave. He asked me again to check out the bedroom to at least see if I liked it, and again I said I was not interested. He looked at me for a moment. Then, to my surprise, he smiled and said okay, stepping aside. I quickly walked past him and straight out the front door. I don't know what was going on in that house, but something didn't feel right about any of it. I even felt lucky to have been able to leave so easily. In the moment, I thought I was going to have to force my way out. I checked Craigslist a couple hours later, and the posting had been removed. I still wonder who and what was in that room upstairs. For all I know, it could have just been an empty room, but something tells me that it was something much worse. Who doesn't enjoy Christmas? It's a time of holidays, family, love, and gifts. It would be a shame if a traumatic event marred the joy of those days, wouldn't it? 
I used to love Christmas, like any other child who likes gifts. But what excited me wasn't really the things I received, but the one who gave them, Santa Claus. As an extremely curious girl, the mystery of that man in red clothes always kept me on my toes, as I wanted to catch him more than anything else. Daddy, help me make cookies! I had even researched what he liked. Dad, can I get Santa Claus a glass of milk? I had also thought of becoming part of his workers. Dad, will you buy me an elf costume? And on this occasion, I wanted to go one step further. Daddy, can we buy a night camera? No, Alicia. I felt as if my heart was breaking as soon as I heard his answer. Why not? That's too much. But I want to see Santa. You can't, little one. It's invisible. If he was, I'd already know at this point. Okay, I'll tell you the truth. My dad finally turned to me and said, He's so fast, you couldn't see him. I just looked at him in annoyance. Can I at least stay awake? I want to check it out. No, honey, you know you have to sleep. Please, make an exception for- I said no. Go to sleep. Even though I didn't want to, I went to my room to follow my dad's orders. There was my little sister, Lori, who was already asleep. It seemed to be very easy for her, but it was really hard for me. In fact, I had to convince myself I would have many other opportunities. When I woke up, it was already dawn. I tried to fall asleep again, but I couldn't. So I quietly got up, left my room, and went downstairs to the kitchen. There, under the Christmas tree, were several presents, but I wasn't really excited. In fact, I was completely disappointed, since the cookies I had made and the milk I had served were still on the table by the tree. Didn't you like what I prepared? Without thinking much, I grabbed the cookies and ate them one by one. But before I could drink the milk, I heard a noise. I wasn't able to see much, but between the curtains... I watched as something red moved outside. Oh. My. God! I quickly ran to the door and opened it. There, near the walls that separated our house from the condominium, something was walking. Even though I wasn't wearing anything warm and my shoes weren't the best under the circumstances, I ran outside. Santa! Santa! I saw the- <sighs> What was walking? was neither a man nor a woman, or at least it didn't look like it. It was some kind of humanoid figure whose legs were spindly. In fact, it looked like a skeleton. A shiver ran down my spine as the seconds ticked by. That thing walked like a spider with missing legs would, since it wobbled as it moved. It was repulsive to watch. Slowly, Trying not to make a sound, I started to back away. But suddenly, the spider went still. Mmm, cookies. From one moment to another, that thing had turned its head. <gasps> His four yellow eyes were staring at me. Eat. This time, instead of wobbling, he started hopping to get closer to me. Cookies. Eat, Santa. When I saw how the hat he was wearing fell to the ground, I reacted and started running towards the forest. <gasps> For a moment, it had seemed like a much better idea to get that creature away from my home, but it was hard to run. Eat. Since the monster seemed to be very close to me, I grabbed a rock as soon as I found one, turned around and threw it at him. The rock had landed right on one of his legs, which bent to the other side. It seemed to be quite painful, so I didn't wait any longer and ran out of there. I wanted to get home as soon as I could, but it was so cold, my nose and throat were starting to hurt, so I stopped and lay down on a tree. When I regained consciousness, the spider's yellow eyes were right in front of me. 
I tried to move, but his feet, or hands, except the one I had hurt, were keeping me still. Smells good, like cookies. With tears in my eyes, I couldn't contain myself any longer and shouted, Let me go! I'm a girl, not a cookie! I can't tell the difference if you ate cookies, especially cookies for me. They weren't for you! They were for Santa Claus! He didn't want them! But now, I need cookies. In that instant, I realized who I had been looking for all that time was right in front of me. Why are you a monster? You always expect something different. A human couldn't do what I do. Suddenly, he started to bring his mouth closer to my right arm. You, you, you wouldn't hurt a child. But you hurt me. Hurt you? A green liquid was also coming out of his bent leg. Now I need cookies. Cookies heal. Wait, 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 I... Ah! Suddenly, I felt a sharp pain in my arm. When I woke up again, I was still there, lying in the snow. My arm was swollen, and I was very cold. I don't know exactly how much time passed, but my dad finally found me. I had to spend days in the hospital for my body to recover. It was him, Dad. It was Santa Claus. Santa Claus doesn't exist, little one. He's not real. Nobody ever believed me, but I know what I saw and heard that day. That's why I do what I do now. Good night, sweetheart. I will not let my family or anyone else find out the truth. In this footage, two girls are seen enjoying a water slide at a theme park. They slowed down in the middle of the slide to spend more time on the ride. All were going well until they heard a rushing sound. They both looked back and saw a freaky woman towards them at full speed. Realizing the woman is soon to hit both of them with full force, they started screaming and even tried to slide away. But before they could, the inevitable happened. The story you are about to see is loosely based on this freaky accident that these girls went through. My sister, Anna, loves visiting water parks. Last Sunday, we went to this water park named Wet or Wild. There were various pools and water fountains, but the main attraction was their zigzag water slide, which was a little high, yet looked exciting. Anna and I decided to save it for last. We were in the washroom. I was fixing my hair after changing into my swimsuit. Anna was still inside one of the bathroom stalls. I was lost in myself when I felt someone standing behind me. The bathroom mirror was aligned to my left, and as I looked at it, my stomach dropped. There was an old, creepy-looking woman standing behind me smelling my hair. She had blood-curdling eyes, which looked like a dead fish. For a few seconds, I forgot to move and watched her smelling my hair like it was her brand of drug. She was so lost in this disgusting act that she didn't even care about getting caught. Suddenly, I heard Anna opening the door, and my rational senses kicked in. I turned around, screaming, Excuse me? Right, Paige. <laughs> I remember when I was thick and pretty like you. Men used to go crazy for me. <laughs> Anna noticed me talking to this creepy woman and asked, Is everything all right, Stella? 
The woman quickly, almost in reflex, turned towards Anna and looked at her with angry, burning eyes. As if Anna had interrupted her in the middle of something very important, she said, Would you mind leaving us alone? What? Can't you see we are in the middle of something? Anna and I were both shocked to see her audacity. That's my sister you are talking to, and it's better if you leave us alone. (laughs) And what if I don't? Then I will keep punching your face till your sagging skin bloats up like a plum. My sister's threat did work. She let out a huge grin and started walking towards the bathroom exit. Before leaving, she turned around one last time and looked me in the eyes. Her head tilted to one side, and she watched me for a minute straight standing like that. I will never forget her eyes. And then gradually walked out. Once she left, I found myself drenched in sweat. I got so nervous. Anna held my hand and said, Don't let the hag get to your head. Let's go. We got on to the rest of our day and kept moving from one water slide to the other. The bursts of enjoyment slowly faded the thought of this creepy old woman from my mind until we saw her getting into a swimming pool wearing a neon yellow swimsuit. The burning color made her look even scarier. She had red lipstick put on and smiled at every boy who went to take a dip in the pool. Hey, how about we teach her a lesson? What do you have in mind? I will swim towards her and then pull her underwater. It'll be fun to watch Miss Wrinkly struggling for her breath. Is that necessary? I mean, what if something... Relax, I won't drown her. It will be a casual prank. She deserves it anyway. Saying this, Anna dived into the pool and disappeared into the water. I stood on the edge, tensely watching what was about to happen. The old woman was floating on the pool, throwing creepy smiles and lustful winks at young boys. She had no idea about Anna approaching her from underwater. Suddenly, her body moved and she got pulled underwater. She began throwing her hand while screaming for help. Anna might have pulled her legs a little hard. By the third pull, her wig came off, revealing her bald head with an uneven spread of white, stringy hair. Her makeup was worn out, and that's when Anna let her go. She got out of the water laughing. Everyone else in the pool probably disliked the woman for her weird behavior. They didn't even try to help her out. Once she got up from the water looking like a crazy witch from Halloween, she saw Anna and me laughing. Anna pointed at her and screamed. Sorry, Grandma, we were just having some fun. Don't mind. (laughs) Even though I laughed, I saw the vengeance in her burning eyes. She quietly got out of the pool, grabbed the wig from the water, and left. I was surprised that she didn't report us to security and went out of sight without giving us any trouble. We happened to be the last ones in queue for the water slide. My eyes were constantly searching the water park, but I didn't see the woman anywhere. The queue moved from one person to the other, and our turn finally came. We moved ahead, and a water park employee guided us to the final step. Don't stop on the ride and keep your legs closed to have a better slide. Enjoy. I sat down on the high edge, and Anna sat behind me. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do this. Anna pushed herself and we started sliding down the ride. Water splashed on the sides with our weight. It was fun, no doubt. We were almost halfway down the slide when Anna said, Let's stop at the next incline to enjoy the view. But the ride attendant told us not to stop. Who cares? We are anyway the last one in the queue. There's no rush. I did as she said, and we grabbed the sides of the slides to slow down. On the next incline, we stopped. Anna stood on the slide. The entire water park was visible from that height. Seeing Anna standing comfortably, I too stood up to catch a glimpse of the view. 
Didn't I tell you it will be fun? Yeah. It's so beautiful. We were cherishing the moment. Just when we heard a ruckus behind us. Turning around, I saw the old woman standing at the top of the slide. The ride attendant was yelling at her. No, you can't go down. We're closed for the day. Ma'am, stop! No! But the old woman pushed the attendant from the top. He fell from the ride, letting out a spine-chilling scream, followed by the sound of bones crushing. The old woman then turned towards us and started coming down the slide like a psycho. Here I come! Be ready to get blown away! (laughs) Before we could do anything, she hit us right away. Anna lost her balance and fell from the edge, landing on the hard concrete. I heard her screaming. My knee! My knee! I have pushed ahead. The old woman and I both slid down the rest of the ride together. The psycho clawed her sharp fingernails into my shoulders. When we reached the end, I saw two men rushing at us. The old woman let me go and immediately ran away. Everyone gathered around. The paramedics were called to take Anna and the ride attendant to the hospital. The attendant broke his ribs, and Anna twisted her knee. Luckily, I was unharmed, except when the woman ripped out a few strands of my hair before running away. The water park authority reported her to the cops, but she hasn't been caught yet. I don't know why she decided to run away with a strand of my hair, but wherever she is now, I hope she burns in hell. I Craigslist is almost never the first place I go when I need to buy something, but sometimes you can get good deals on things that would otherwise be really expensive. At the time, I was searching for new workout equipment. Weights and machines are really expensive to buy new, so Craigslist was the perfect way to find used ones for cheap. Anyways, I scrolled through the site for a few days before eventually finding a posting that looked really good. It was a set of weights for a pretty good deal, and was posted only a few hours ago. The poster's name was Mary, so I sent her an email and told her I was very interested in her weight set and would like to pick them up as soon as possible. Mary replied just a few minutes later, saying that she was available tonight when she got home from work at 7. It was a little bit late, but it wasn't too big of a deal for me since I wanted them as soon as possible. I agreed, and she responded with her address. Of course, I looked it up to see where it was and what the house looked like. It was 20 minutes away in a small neighborhood that I was actually familiar with as one of my old friends used to live nearby. The house was regular sized and didn't have any real defining features other than the fact that it looked pretty old, but nothing looked too strange or gave me bad vibes, so that night I drove down there. The place was at the end of the road in a cul-de-sac so I parked on the side of the house by their mailbox and made my way up to the front door, which was already opened. I didn't want to just walk into the house, so I knocked on the open door a few times to get their attention. A moment later, a man comes down from the hall. Um, hi. I was supposed to meet with Mary to look at some workout stuff she had posted on Craigslist. The man's face lit up, and he said to come on in. He told me that Mary would be down in a few minutes as she was changing out of her work clothes. This definitely made me cautious, but he sounded genuine and believable, so I followed him into his living room where there was a set of weights on the ground. However, aside from the weights, there was nothing else in the room, no furniture or decorations at all. I think the man saw me looking around as he quickly said that they were in the process of moving out and that's why they were trying to sell the weights. Still skeptical, I looked at them for a second, but immediately noticed that a few plates were missing. I asked him if this was everything, as I thought I saw more in the pictures. He smiled again, telling me that Mary might know where the other ones are, but then he just stood there looking at me. I got really uncomfortable and asked him if he could go check on Mary to let her know I was here. He waited for a moment, and then he agreed and walked up the stairs. I was obviously beginning to worry that Mary might not even be a real person at this point, so I listened intently to make sure he was talking to someone. 
After a few seconds of silence, I went over to the bottom of the stairs and looked up towards the top. The man was standing there at the top, just staring at the wall, probably waiting up there to make it seem like he actually went to ask someone. I fell into a panic, knowing now that this was all a lie and I was likely in the middle of something horrible. I started to quickly walk towards the front door, trying not to alert the man, but as soon as I turned around, I heard heavy footsteps rushing down the stairs. He called out for me to wait as I ran straight out the front door and into my car. Strangely, as I drove away, the guy ran out the front door and around the side of the house. I pulled over after driving out of the neighborhood and called the police to let them know what happened in hopes that they could figure out what was going on. I didn't really know what the man's plan was, but I was confident enough that he was up to something. The officers later came by my house and I gave them more information. They told me that the house I met him at had nobody living there for over a year, which made chills run through my body. Of course though, I couldn't really give them much helpful information other than a description of what the man looked like. And other than that, all they had to go off of was the weights that he'd put in the empty house that may have fingerprints on them. It worries me that he might still be out there trying to lure people into abandoned homes, but I'm also glad that I was able to make it out of there before he did whatever it was that he planned on doing. My name's Adam, and as ridiculous as it sounds, I'm terrified of water. I'm sure you'll think there's nothing weird about this, right? In fact, it is. Because I'm not only afraid of rivers, oceans, or seas, but I'm also afraid of lakes, swimming pools, and even bathtubs. Although I was very vocal in expressing my fear when I was a kid, no one seemed to care. I still remember the day my fear intensified. The day I almost drowned. That day, my dad took me and my brothers to a water park. I didn't want to go, but my brothers couldn't stop talking about the water park. Dad, can I stay in the car? I don't want to go in there. I don't like water parks. The answer's no. Your brothers wanted to come here, so I brought them here. But I'll have a hard time, Dad. I don't want to come here. You're not the damn center of the world, Adam. This is my only day with you, so don't ruin it for me or your brothers. At the end of the day, your mom will come looking for you, and you can both talk trash about me all you want. But, Dad... End of discussion. Saying this, my dad just kept walking, ignoring me. When we went to the locker room, we put on our bathing suits, and while my brothers ran to the pool, I shyly went to the shallow end and stayed with the younger kids and the moms. Hey, Adam, stop embarrassing me and come over here with us. It's not even that deep. You can easily put your feet in. Dad, you shouldn't insist on him coming. We wanted to come without him. We didn't want him to... And who asked you for your opinion? Adam, come here, now! Yes, Dad. With every step I took, I felt the cold water creeping up my body. I was terrified. I didn't want to take another step. Look at your face! <laughs> How come you're so afraid of water? You're here and nothing happened! So stop being a crybaby! Not for nothing, I didn't have daughters! <laughs> yes, Dad, you're right. It's just water. I won't be afraid of it. Adam, you don't have to do this. No, it's okay. I'll stay. The minutes passed and I was trying to move, trying to make this nightmare a little bit more bearable. One of my brothers was playing in the deep end, so my dad went to get him, and I was left alone. Suddenly, I started to feel the water getting colder and colder. I was freezing. I thought about taking advantage of my dad's absence to get away, but the moment I turned around, something stopped me. A hand grabbed my foot and pulled me back. I was on my back, so I couldn't see who it was, but that hand grabbed my foot with a lot of force and pulled me into the deep end. My whole body fell into the water. I tried to swim, but it was of no use. It was much stronger than me. I began to drown until someone put his hand on my neck and lifted me up. Kid, I leave you alone for 20 seconds and you're already drowning in a pool half a meter deep. I looked behind me and there was no one there. My foot was loose too. Whoever grabbed me had let go. Dad, I need to go now. Please, I can't stay here any longer. <sighs> Adam... I'm being very patient here. We already had this talk. I assured you I would love you not to be here. You clearly prefer your mother. 
Unfortunately, I have to spend the day with you, so I'm warning you, for the last time, stop complaining or you'll regret it. Do you understand? Yes. Dad, seriously, you shouldn't push Adam like this. Tate, I told you! I didn't ask for your opinion! I'm sorry. Adam, do you really want to get out of the pool? <sighs> Alright, we'll go to the water slides instead. Yes, okay, anything but the pool. My brothers also happily agreed and went up the slides. The slide was quite high and luckily far away from the water. My brother went first. He screamed with happiness as he fell. I smiled in anticipation, but when I saw my brother reach the bottom, I realized something terrible. How had I not thought of it? All the slides end in the deep end of the water. I turned around to get off, but behind me was an unyielding, angry face. My dad was staring at me. I had no choice but to jump. I slid down at full speed with my eyes closed. The ride lasted a few seconds, which felt like an eternity. I fell into the water and my brother was nowhere near. He was already reaching the surface. I started to swim towards him to get out of the deep part of the pool, but again, something prevented me to do so. Someone grabbed my foot again, a hand coming from the bottom of the water. I struggled to swim again, but as before, it was useless. That which was underwater pulled me down and I panicked. My whole body was underwater. I moved my hands everywhere trying to get out of the situation and I felt that the water on my back was freezing. I turned around and saw it. The corpse of a child was floating in front of me. I screamed in panic underwater and in response to this, his eyes suddenly opened and stared at me. At that moment, my body became paralyzed. I could no longer move. My mouth was still open, and I could feel the water coming down my throat. Everything began to blur, and my eyes began to close. Somehow, I was alive. Out of embarrassment, my father picked me up and walked with me to the car, not saying a word to me. Before I got to the car, I met my mother, who arrived desperate and furious to face him. Damn it, how does this woman know we're here? As soon as my father said this, my brother gave me a little kick, smiled, and looked at the cell phone in his pocket. You sick psycho. How could you bring Adam to a water park? Are you out of your mind? After what happened? How am I supposed to know anything happened to him in a water park? Oh my god. Unbelievable. How little do you listen to me? How little do you know about your son? While my parents were screaming, I looked at the water park in the distance. And peeking out of the water, I saw the same boy who tried to drown me earlier. I knew that boy. I killed him. About two years ago, I went to this same water park. I was trying to swim in the deep end with a boy I met that same day. We were both too young to be there, but we didn't care. In the middle of the water, I got a cramp and panicked. In order not to drown, I grabbed the boy. Because of my weight, he sank under the water. When the lifeguard got us, only one of us were lucky enough to tell the story. Until that day, I was afraid to go to the water park because of what had happened. But that day, when the boy almost took revenge, everything changed. From that moment on, I began to see that boy everywhere. It was as if returning to the park had brought that child from the dead, who now stalked me whenever I saw water staring at me, waiting for a chance to take revenge for killing him. It's been 30 years since then. I have my own son, and still, everything's the same. I learned to live with that, but I know that one of these days, sooner or later, the child will have another chance to take my life, as I took his. Parties are supposed to be fun, right? I used to really like them, as I had a lot of fun. But being surrounded by a bunch of strangers is not a good idea. You never know what their plans may be. When I was in my 20s, I befriended two girls who were from rich and important families, Kelly and Nicole. I hadn't done it on purpose. I'm not that kind of person. We had just met and had fun together. Anyway, that Christmas, I had been with my family. So for New Year's Eve, I was planning to go to a party. You know, I wanted to have a good time listen to music, dance, and watch the fireworks once the new year came. 
Do you want to go to a party with us? Oh, are you guys going to throw one? <laughs> no, this is much better. We were invited to a great party in a huge penthouse. We'll be able to see the fireworks right above our heads. <laughs> Sounds great. So you're in, right? On the night of December 31st, they picked me up in Kelly's car. We did a few things before we went to the party, so we got to the building much later than I would have liked. But it didn't bother me. Together, we got into the elevator. I didn't even need to look at the floor number, as I knew we had arrived the instant I heard the loud music. So, is there a list or something? <laughs> what made you think it's exclusive, honey? I understood what Nicole was talking about the instant we entered the penthouse. It was truly huge. More than it might have seemed from the outside so it didn't matter how many people showed up. But anyway, I was surprised that it wasn't exclusive. I mean, the party was perfect. The lights, the music, the mini bar, the pool, and of course, the view. What are you waiting for, Sarah? Have fun. No need to tell me. I started to dance through the crowd until at some point, someone tried to give me a drink. No thanks, I'll go get mine myself. As I approached the mini bar, I noticed that my two friends were already there, drinking cocktails. Tired of dancing already? Not at all, just a little thirsty. What are you gonna drink? I turned to look at the bartender and said, surprise me, okay? I no longer remember what I drank on that occasion. I only know that I quickly returned to the dance floor. I felt as if I was under an incredible spell but it soon broke. Oh my God, are you okay, Mark? I'm fine, it was just a push. It took me a moment to realize what had happened. I'm so sorry, sir. Be more careful. Are you sure you're okay? They were both extravagantly dressed, but I wasn't sure that was what set them apart from the others. Since you're here, could you help us? Mark must be taken to rest. Sure. With your permission, sir. I grabbed the wheelchair and walked with them into a long hallway that connected to a bunch of rooms. One of these is fine, right? Continue walking. He needs silence. I didn't think it could be so quiet at the end of the hall, but it was. This is the room. Open the door. From here, no one could hear us, and neither could we. So I started to get nervous. My hand shook as I opened the door. Then I turned to see the woman. What are you looking at? Keep going. I felt so pressured that I entered the room with a lump in my throat. Then I left the man by the bed and I was turning around when I heard the door close. The woman was blocking the way. I think it's time for me to go. She smiled. So soon? You can keep helping us. I think I've done enough. You did something, but not enough. You hurt Mark, don't you understand? I started to feel sweat covering my cold skin. There are still many things that a person like you can do. Like me, I thought. You will help me, won't you? You'll give him what he wants most. When she pointed at my legs, I reacted and soon walked towards the door. Back off. You can't leave yet. Without hesitation, I pushed her with all the strength I had. Ah! In the blink of an eye, she was on the floor. That's when I opened the door. Don't even think about it. But before I could get out, I felt the woman dig her long nails into my leg. Ah! Stay here, bitch. You ain't done with your work. Every second, she tightened her grip. Barbara. I'm busy here. Let her go. She fight too much. It took a few minutes for the woman to release me. Keep your stupid mouth shut or you'll regret it. It didn't take long for me to start running down the hallway that suddenly seemed much longer. But all of a sudden, a door opened. <laughs> stupid bitch. As soon as I heard the voice, I panicked. I didn't want another psycho trying to hurt me. So I hid in a room and locked it. And now what? <laughs> Relax, man. Let's wait a minute. Why should we? That bunch of idiots are not going to find out. We'll wait. Understand? Fine. Did you see those girls in the pool? You know they're off limits. 
Once the voices had faded away, I waited a little longer and then walked out. I got back into the crowd as fast as I could and started looking for my friends. I had to pass between people. This time, everything felt different. Everyone was sweating and dancing weirdly. It really seemed like they were in the clouds. Finally, I found my friends lying on chairs in front of the pool. What's wrong with you? Did you drink too much? We have to go. There's something really wrong about this party. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. Everything's fine. You just drank too much. I'm serious. There are some psychos around here. They tried to hurt me. And there are some men who are planning something really bad. I think they even talked about you. We need to go. They just stared at me as their smile slowly faded away. You didn't drink enough, did you? What? Didn't they tell you to keep your mouth shut? I... I don't understand you. They looked at each other. When Nicole nodded, Kelly got up. Couldn't you have had fun like the others? We invited all these stupid, poor, and desperate people so we can play as we please. I started backing away as she got closer to me. They are nothing more than useless puppets. But you know what the best of all is? That even if someone like you finds out what we're doing, there's nothing you can do. Any mouth can be silenced with money. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Have fun, Sarah. Kelly pushed me, and suddenly I felt very cold. I had fallen into the pool, but was too shocked to react until I started to hear the fireworks. When I got out as fast as I could, in front of me, I saw it. A man was screaming in pain because he no longer had his hand. As I coughed, I figured that fireworks accident was just another part of the sick plan. Luckily, that night I arrived home safe and sound. People have never believed my story. But I understand. It's difficult to accept that such horrible things can remain hidden. For everyone, Christmas is a time of joy, a time of happiness, togetherness, and presence. For me, it's a nightmare that I relive again and again and again. An endless nightmare that will haunt me until the day I die. It all started when I was only 10 years old. I was just a helpless and innocent child, unable to defend myself. My mother was telling me a story before I went to sleep, while my brother listened in his bed, laughing. And that's the end. Did you like the story? Yes, Mom. Well, it's time to go to sleep, honey. By the time you wake up tomorrow, Daddy will be back home. And together, we'll see what Santa brought you. Mom, the Grinch wasn't bad, was he? No, honey, he was just lonely. When he felt the Christmas spirit, he became good. So if we are good to bad people, they will become good? Yes, honey, of course. Hey, Eileen, don't believe that story. It's made for children. What do you mean? In the real story, the Grinch is a monster who wants to steal Christmas by eating children. Gabriel, don't tell her that. Go to sleep. You're lying. You're a child, too. And the Grinch will eat you, too. Yeah, but I'm a year older. It'll eat you first. Mom! No one will eat anyone. It's just a story. Both of you, stop talking about the Grinch and go to sleep. Yes, yes Mom. Mom. As she was leaving, my mom turned off the lights and said goodnight. I was already afraid, and I didn't want to go to sleep. My eyes began to adjust to the darkness. I could see something, but everything was still too blurry. Gabby, is it true that the Grinch is coming to eat me? Are you still going on about that? Let it go, Eileen. The Grinch won't eat you. You're too ugly. Hey, I'm not ugly. Yes, you are. If anything, he's more likely to eat me first. I'm much prettier than you. No, you're mean and ugly. Gabriel? Brother, are you there? Answer me, you're scaring me. <laughs> Mom! Gabriel, stop scaring your sister. Don't make me come in there. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> I scared you. You're not funny. Tomorrow, I'll tell Daddy, too. <laughs> ah! Brother, 
This isn't funny. Get out of there or I'll tell mom. I was convinced that my threat would work to stop my brother from making jokes. But after a few seconds, I started to worry. Gabby? Uh, are you there? In response to my question, a hand came out from under the bed, clutching my mattress. That was not my brother. His fingers were long, dirty, and hairy. But what scared me the most was that they were green. Who are you? What are you doing here? I'll tell mom and dad. Ignoring my warning, a head slowly peeked out from under my bed. Its eyes were red and yellow. Its gaze was despicable, full of anger as if he hated me. Before I could scream, the other hand reached out from under the bed and grabbed my head, pulling me out of my bed. Mom! It's the Grinch! As I screamed, the monster's hand grabbed my leg and began to pull me under the bed. No! 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 Suddenly, the hand stopped and the lights came on. Eileen, what happened? Are you all right? Mom, there's a monster under the bed. It's the Grinch. He ate Gabby and now he's coming for me. <sighs> okay, Gabriel. This time, you've gone too far. When your father gets here, you'll be in trouble, boy. <laughs> I couldn't believe what was happening. My mom and my brother were gone. I tried to run, but my body didn't respond. I just stood there, shaking, listening to my mom screaming under the bed until after a few seconds. She stopped. Immediately, the Grinch's eyes glowed under the bed, looking in my direction. The beast came out slowly and carefully, staring at me. He walked past me, and with a cruel smile, turned off the light and closed the door. From that moment on, I could only hear two things. The beating of my heart, and the Grinch's footsteps walking slowly in my direction. Each step louder than the last, more full of hatred, cruelty, and sadism. My fate was written. There was no escape from this. My blood froze and my energy returned to my body, but not to escape or fight. I could only scream. The monster had stopped walking, but not because I scared it. No, but because it was next to me. I couldn't see it, but I felt something wet behind me. It was his breath. Then I heard a much louder breath and a scary noise behind me. The Grinch was slowly opening his mouth, ready to eat me, but enjoying my fear and doing it very slowly. At the climax, a louder noise followed. It was a door slamming. My dad had come home from work. He quickly turned on the light and looked at me with concern. The Grinch was gone. Honey, what's wrong? Where's your mom and brother? Life came back into my body and I ran as fast as I could, grabbing him by the jacket. Dad, run! There's a monster! It's the Grinch! We must go now! Without understanding, he followed my lead and ran with me. We were outside the house. Eileen, stop! We have to run, Dad. He'll catch us! Honey, go to the neighbor's house and tell them to call the police. If a bad man came in to rob us, I have to save Mom and Gabby. No, Daddy. It's not a man. It's the Grinch. He'll eat you! Listen to me, sweetie. Daddy will be back soon. You just go to the neighbor's house. And just like that, my dad went back into the house. That was the last time I saw him. The next few days, the police tried to investigate what happened. They never found the culprit, nor could they believe me. Since I had no relatives who could take care of me, my neighbors agreed to raise me. They were like parents to me. From that day on, there wasn't a Christmas that I didn't think the Grinch would come looking for me. But I am no longer afraid. I'm a very cheerful girl, but at Christmas, I'm always alone. I turn off the lights and sit in the middle of my room with a gun in my hand, waiting for the Grinch to come back and try to finish his job. 
I lived with a friend of mine who I'll refer to as Nick in a small house for a few years during college. He was my roommate for the first year, and then we decided to move out of the dorms and share the rent on a house since we both had decent enough jobs. This was both of our first times renting a place, so we didn't really know how to budget properly. After a few months, everything was okay, but it was almost a year in when we realized that this place was eating up both of our bank accounts. So the obvious solutions were to either move out or find another roommate. Neither of us wanted to leave, so we started the search for a roommate. We started by asking all of our other friends, but none of them were interested. So really the only option was to put up a post online. I made a post on Facebook Marketplace, and Nick made a post on Craigslist. Again, neither of us have ever done this, and it felt kind of weird, but we knew we didn't have much of a choice. A few weeks went by with just a couple of responses, but none of them seriously considering moving in, before Nick shows me an email he got from someone named Sam replying to his Craigslist post. The guy seemed legit, and the following day he came over to view the house. I should mention, he was a couple years older than us and had just graduated, but he seemed pretty nice and looked clean and everything, so we were glad to have him. He agreed to the split of rent and moved in the next week. In the few months following, Sam would hang out with us a lot, and we actually got to know him pretty well. But then all of a sudden, he became very closed off for some reason. Nick and I would barely ever see the guy, and when we did, he wouldn't even talk. He would sit in his room for the most part, with his door shut, and would only come out to get food or to go to work. It didn't bother me necessarily, I just found it a little strange. Anyways, it was around month four with him being there that things started to take a turn for the worst. I had just gotten home from work, and immediately as I walked through the door, Nick calls my name quietly from the living room. What's going on? He mentions that Sam was home, so to not talk too loud. Then he tells me about a strong smell he noticed when passing his room today. I told him I hadn't noticed it. He points down the hall towards Sam's room and tells me to quietly walk past and see if I notice. So, I got up and made my way quietly down the hall towards Sam's door. I didn't even have to get very close to smell what he was talking about. It was awful and really disgusting. I had no idea what it was and had definitely never smelled it in the house before. Nick suggested we ask him what it was, and I agreed. We both went to his door, trying not to breathe in too hard, and knocked. Then knocked again and again, calling out to him. He didn't answer. Nick said he was sure that Sam was in there, but after a couple more minutes we just gave up and figured we'd ask him tomorrow. It was already pretty late at this point, so we both made a quick dinner and then ate while watching TV in the living room, and then we both went to bed. The next day, I caught Sam on his way out of the house and asked him what the smell was last night. Oh, uh, I was just taking out the trash. He quickly left and drove off. That answer didn't really make any sense to me, but I didn't want to press him too hard. I told Nick later that day, and he agreed that it was weird, but didn't know what else to do, so we left it at that. Another couple weeks go by. Again, Sam barely talked to us but the smell had gone away by now. I got home from work late one night, and Nick and Sam were both in the rooms, already asleep probably, so I pretty much went straight up to my room and fell asleep as well. But sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up hearing some movement below my room, which was where Sam's room was located downstairs. I listened for a couple minutes, trying to figure out what he was doing, but eventually I fell back asleep. The next morning, Sam ran out of the house to go to work as usual, however, he didn't return home that night. Another couple days would go by, and he still hadn't come home. I called him multiple times, and his phone instantly went to voicemail. We were actually starting to get worried, and decided to check his room to see if there were any clues as to what was going on. His room was pretty messy, and actually kind of looked like a lot of his stuff had been packed up and taken out. I also found a pair of glasses in his drawer, with some other random belongings, which was weird because Sam didn't wear glasses. He left some clothes and all of his furniture behind though, 
which made us believe that he didn't just move out suddenly. Nick ended up calling the police to notify them about Sam possibly being missing, and an officer arrived that night to investigate and ask us questions. We told him everything we knew and let him look at his room. Nick also gave him a picture that we had taken together back when Sam first moved in. After that, we didn't get an update until a week later. A different detective called us and informed us that the identity of the man in the photo with us was not Sam. They said a family member recognized them as their missing son who had been gone for almost a year. After that, the case got a lot more complicated and we didn't have much helpful information because the guy pretty much lied about everything he told us. So after a little bit, we lost contact and stopped getting updates. As far as we were told, the man was just some regular guy that was living with his parents, who suddenly went missing for no known reason. He never came back to our house though, and I'm not sure if he was ever found. It's definitely the most interesting and creepy experience I've had though, just knowing that I was living in the same house as someone who made up a completely fake identity and was legally missing gives me chills every time I think about it. It's pretty hard not to assume that this man was trying to hide from the police because of something he had done, or was still doing. There are many water parks that are gigantic, with more attractions than you can imagine. But haven't you thought about the six secrets that can be hidden in so many miles? When I was a kid, around the age of 12, my grandfather and my mom had the great idea of taking me and my little brother, Matt, to a very famous water park. Are we almost there, Mom? It's been hours. I want to swim. My grandfather from the passenger seat was the one who answered. Not long to be there, Aaron. The truth was that I loved swimming. There was no sport that I liked more than feeling the water on my skin and moving through it. Once we got to the water park and were inside, I couldn't be happier to see all the slides and games, but there was one that caught my attention more than the others. It was very high. In fact, many stairs had to be climbed to get there. In my opinion, it was worth it, since it was like a labyrinth of small slides in which you entered through one and you didn't know where you were going to come out. Mom, can we do that one? Come on, come on! Sure, Aaron. But remember, we have to put on our bathing suits first. Once we were ready to have fun, we started walking towards the attraction. My mom, who was holding my younger brother's hand, was taking too long. Mom, hurry up! Relax, Aaron. Mom, let's go together. I told you... I noticed how my brother looked the attraction up and down as his eyes filled with tears. No, I don't want to, I don't want to! Matt... What's wrong? He hugged our mom tightly. I don't want to be here. It's scary. You don't have to slide, honey. I'll take you to the pool and... No, I don't want to. Dad, can you take Aaron up there? But mom... Go ask if you can use the slide by yourself. You're a big kid after all. If they say no, you'll have to wait a little longer, okay? Yes, mom. Come on, champ. Together, my grandfather and I started up the stairs. Why don't you come with me, Grandpa? <laughs> you know I'm too old for that. Once we got to the top, we saw the person in charge of the attraction. He was a tall and skinny young man, so pale that he didn't seem to work there every day. Hey, uh, do you think my grandson can go alone? The man thought about his answer for a while, but finally smiled and said, Sure, man, why not? His expression did nothing but make me nervous. Uh, Grandpa, I, I... Come on, Aaron. If this nice young man says that's allowed... He continued to stare at me while smiling. Sure. I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible, so I decided to make it the funniest way. I picked one of the slides and got ready. Have fun! In the blink of an eye, I was sliding down with the help of the water. Whoa! I was really having fun, until... Woo! <coughs> a lot of water fell on my face, filling my eyes and almost my lungs as well. Shortly after that, I felt the slide slope down even more. I was still coughing by the time I felt my feet were no longer in contact with the slide. <coughs> 
Suddenly, I reached the bottom of the slide and fell into the water. I quickly got up and coughed again until I didn't have to anymore. I soon rubbed my eyes. When I opened them, I saw a strange place. Uh... Although not bright enough, the place was lit up. The walls had the design of a sky and even a window, but there was no sign of another person. Hello? I tried to look out the window, but since there didn't seem to be anything on the other side, I started walking towards the hallway. Even though the water was barely knee-deep, it didn't seem like a place made for younger children. Anyone there? How do I get out of here? I didn't stop, even though I started to despair. The only things that could be seen were white tiles and water, but at some point, I came to a room that had a staircase in the middle of it. Cool. I ran up them, only to be disappointed when I saw another empty room, but this time something was different. The water was very dark, not like it was dirty, but just black. Ugh! Huh? Suddenly, I began to notice small ripples forming in the water, but it wasn't me causing them. There, in one of the corners of the place, something was floating. It took me a while to realize that it was hair. Um, hello? As soon as I spoke again, what looked like a woman started coming out of the water. Her appearance gave me chills, as she was too tall and so skinny that her bones showed. Her sinister face looked more like a skeleton than a living being. Without hesitation, I started running down a hallway to the right. I was trying to be as fast as I could, but the water stopped me. Suddenly, a blow to my torso made me fall. I tried to get up as fast as I could, but a hand began to press my head into the water. Soon, I managed to hit her skinny arm, which caused the creature to let go of me, so I kept running. The corridors became narrower and narrower, so I started to feel bad due to claustrophobia. In fact, it didn't take long for me to start hyperventilating. Please let go of me! (laughs) Suddenly, at the end of the hallway, I saw something red. It looked like a slide. Yes, yes! As soon as I realized it, I started to swim towards the slide. But then, one of the woman's hands grabbed my neck. I couldn't breathe in any way. Since I was underwater and the creature was pressing harder and harder, I started to feel like my breath was running out. So with what strength I had left, I grabbed the woman's hand, pulled it away from my neck, and bit down. It didn't take long for me to get my hand out of the water and breathe without stopping swimming. But soon, I felt that thin hand trying to grab my ankle. I didn't stop shaking to prevent her from catching me. It seemed like forever, but I finally got to the slide. Without hesitation, I sat on it and was about to go down when the creature's hand grabbed my hair. Ah, let go of me! Despite the pain, I finally made it. (laughs) Once I got off the slide, I ran into my mom. Oh my gosh, Aaron, what happened? Everyone thought that I had hurt myself inside the slide and had been knocked unconscious, but I know that that place hides more things than it should. I wish I didn't believe in anything anymore, but it's impossible. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? But for a person who has seen them, it's impossible not to, even if they don't want to. Well, the same thing happens to me with tarot after what happened a few years ago. When I started college, I cared more about parties than anything else, as I just wanted to dance and have fun. It was then that I met Tracy. She and I became very good friends in a short time. In fact, thanks to her, I met many new people and places. You like to come with me, don't you? What kind of a question is that? You know I do. We always have a good time together. Yeah, 
I can tell you love to light up every place you go. Well, that's one way of saying we're queens. Want to know my secret? Secret? I thought. Yeah, why not? Instead of continuing to walk beside me, my friend stopped and looked at me for a few seconds. Tracy? I was just thinking. A woman has been reading me the tarot. Would you like to try it? I've never done anything like that, but I'm sure it'll be fun. I'm curious, you know? My friend and I got into a taxi that took us to the other side of the city. Please stop here. We got off in front of an unusual looking house as it was narrow, but seemed to have several floors. Without hesitation, Tracy walked to the door and rang the star-shaped doorbell. From inside the building, the voice of an old woman spoke. Who wants to talk to me? I'm Tracy. But you're not the one who wants to, are you? I brought you a friend of mine. When the door opened, there was no one behind it. Soon, my friend made a motion with her hand for me to follow her. Once I entered and closed the door, I was able to take a look inside the place. It was as if we were in a totally different time and place, with all those fabrics adorning the walls, the candles instead of lamps, and the smell of some type of incense. Tracy? We kept walking from one room to another. It was all pretty confusing. Suddenly, I felt something pointy touch my back, so I turned around. Ah! There was a tall old woman, extravagantly dressed, who was pointing a finger at me. Her long nails almost looked like blades. Hello, Debbie. Please, come in. Inside the room, Tracy had already made herself comfortable sitting in a chair. What do you want me to do for you? Read me the tarot? Do you do anything else? <laughs> The first time is always something simple. The woman sat in front of a table and grabbed the cards that were on it. Once she started shuffling them, she said, Come, sit down. Don't be shy. I approached, even though I wasn't feeling well. Everything was so strange that the atmosphere was suffocating. What do you want to know? What's your question? Uh... The incense smoke was giving me a headache. Is everything going to remain as perfect as it is now? <laughs> little by little, she put five cards on the table. Queen of Pentacles, the Devil. Cups, the Magician. Queen of Swords, truly interesting. What does it mean? Someone wants to hurt you. What? Someone close to you. I don't... Huh? Suddenly, I felt something on my head, so I touched it while the woman continued talking. I can feel it. Her instability. Her intelligence. She'll make it. I looked at my hand. I realized that what was on my head was a dense substance. What? I can almost smell your desperation. Being betrayed will be... Stop! I immediately got up and turned to look at my friend. Please, let's go. Tracy approached me, and together we left that place. But not before listening once more to the woman... This is not something you can choose to believe, Debbie. Once we were outside the building, my friend spoke. I'm happy I brought you. She told me something similar and she was right. Now you can do something about it too. I was so dizzy I could barely hear her. That was horrible. That's the point. Sometimes the truth is cruel. I meant the place and her. She's a tarot reader. What did you expect? I don't know. I... I don't feel so good. Tracy helped me get into a cab to go home. She accompanied me all the way, as if she was taking care of me. See you later. I opened the car door and was about to get out when my friend spoke. Wait, looks like you're going to collapse at any moment. Let me help you. Just like she said, she helped me walk home. 
I really just wanted to sit down, so I went to the living room. There was my sister, Cindy. Where were you? Huh? My God, didn't you hear me? I asked where you were. I just stared at her. Why is she so angry, I thought. Ugh, look at you, you're a mess. Stop it. Can't you be more normal? I dare you to get home without being like this for a single day. At least I'm not always locked up at home. At least I'm not drunk. My sister got up and left the room, whereupon she ran into Tracy. And stop bringing your stupid friends. Tracy looked at me in surprise. I'm sorry. Don't worry. Why don't you go wash your face? Maybe it will help. Yeah. Once I got into the bathroom, I turned on the faucet and started washing my face. Someone wants to hurt you. Huh? All of a sudden, breathing was becoming more and more difficult. Someone wants to hurt you. I could have sworn I could still hear her. It was driving me crazy. When I rubbed my eyes and opened them, there she was. Someone wants to hurt you. Ah! I left the bathroom, feeling as if my heart was going to jump out of my mouth. But it wasn't much better, since in front of me I found a monster with long arms and legs, a small head, and a dog's snout. <sighs> shit! 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 I ran up the stairs as fast as I could get to my room. <sighs> I stood there, still, hoping the monster wasn't following me. But then, I heard something. <laughs> When I turned around, I saw her. That witch was rummaging through my drawers, which shocked me so much, I wasn't able to contain myself. Ah! I lunged at her in an explosion of rage. What did you do to me, witch? Without even thinking about it, I began to choke her with my bare hands. Stop! It's me, Debbie! Cindy? Oh my god, I'm so sorry! I got away from her as fast as I could. Your friend is sick. My sister dropped something from her hand. A glass jar filled with a substance and pieces of hair. <laughs> when I turned around, my friend was there looking at me. I enjoyed every second. It all made sense as soon as I heard her. She was right. Someone wanted to hurt me. She was right about you too, envious bitch. Since that day, I have not been able to stop going to a tarot reader. I know it's not good, but I need to know even the smallest truth. Hey guys, my name's Gaston, and I'm from Argentina. My native country may have a province as modern as Buenos Aires, but where it stands out the most is in the other provinces as we have waterfalls, glaciers, jungles, and mountains. But not everything is as nice as it sounds, since hidden in the most dangerous areas of the countryside, there are beings so terrifying that would make any adventurer lock himself inside the house. For the people of Buenos Aires, these are nothing more than myths. But the day my school decided to make a field trip and took me and my friends to these places, we discovered that at least one of these legends is real. That day, we met the Chupacabra, and not believing in it almost cost us our lives. It all started on a Friday morning. I remember how surprised we all were that the school agreed to a trip that would last the whole weekend, since it was really far away and it would take several hours to go back and forth. When we arrived, we settled into a cabin near a farm. We didn't have a campfire or any of those things that people think you do on a field trip. That night, we simply ate in the cabin, while our teacher, a horror fan, told us stories of the place. I guess you all heard about the Chupacabra, right? Everyone nodded in agreement, not paying much attention. Most of us were between 15 and 16 years old, but the professor treated us as if we were nine. Well, I'm glad everyone is so cultured, but not many know what the Chupacabra really is. Everyone looked on in silence, some interested and others bored. You may think the chupacabra is a myth, but rest assured it's very real. Some say it's an animal that feeds on cattle. 
Others say it's a demon sent by Satan himself. No matter what name you call it, what matters is that if you see it, you will not live to tell the tale. Some people started to get scared, but between me and my friends, we laughed it off. The chupacabra will have no compassion for you. It may be small, but its fangs are enormous, and its thirst is insatiable. It will jump on your necks and sink its teeth into your throat. You will not be able to do anything. Just watch and feel how your blood feeds this terrifying being, which will not stop until it drains you like raisins. Many of my classmates were a little uncomfortable, not because of the chupacabra, but because of the cringe that they were feeling. Hey, don't be afraid. It's just a story, but be careful tonight. Bedtime came rather quickly, but far from being afraid or sleepy about the story, we were intrigued. So when everyone was going to sleep, we decided to make a little improvised field trip into the forest. How easy it was to get out of the cabin. Yeah, I thought they were going to see us when we went through the cattle. Nah, it was obvious nothing would happen. They were all asleep. Where are we going now? We, my friend, are going to look for a chupacabra. Let's go deeper into the forest. What if we run into an animal? No big deal. There's only cows here. What was that? Nice try, Edward. No, really. I saw a shadow pass by. Didn't you hear it? Are you serious? I swear, I heard something. You guys shouldn't be here. Ah! Crap! What the hell do you think you're doing here? Professor, oh, we went to see if the story you told us about the chupacabra was true. We were on our way back. You can't just run away like that. I'm in charge of you. If anything happens to you, I'm responsible. Sorry. <sighs> Guys, the chupacabra thing is a story I tell all the time. It's just an urban legend. I've been coming here for years and I've never seen a... Ah! Help! Before we could react, a strange black creature jumped on the professor's neck. Was this the chupacabra? We approached to try and get it off of his neck, but to our surprise, we were not alone. Behind our professor came five other identical creatures, which began to feed on the blood of their victim. In a matter of seconds, the corpse was drained, as if there were only bones and skin. The demons raised their red eyes and looked at us. Run, run! We ran as fast as we could into the forest, but it was no use. They were gaining on us. The tree, let's get up! We can't, they're gonna catch us! I grabbed a stick and delayed the chupacabras, who far from being scared were only calculating my movements to attack me. At that moment, Edward and Marion managed to climb a tree. Come on, grab my hand! I was heading in their direction, but I knew I wasn't going to make it, so I kept running. What I didn't know was that ahead of me, there was a downhill path, so I tripped over a branch and started to fall. During the fall, my knee hit a rock. The chupacabra stayed trying uselessly to climb the tree, and I thought I was safe. But to my surprise, one of them followed me. I was helpless. I couldn't stand up from the pain, and this being, who seemed to know it, started to move slowly towards me. I tried to hit it with a rock, but it quickly dodged me, and with enormous strength, used its teeth to attach itself to my foot. The pain was indescribable. I felt the chupacabra sucking the blood from all over my body, and I could do nothing to defend myself. I tried to grab it without success. Then, I hit it, and nothing worked. There was only one solution. I grabbed a huge stone next to me, and with all my strength, I stood up. With the demon still biting me, I smashed the stone against my foot with all my strength. The chupacabra and I screamed in pain. Instantly, I felt my attacker lose strength, and, already dead, it let released my foot. Relieved but full of pain, I looked down and realized that my freedom had come at a great cost. My foot was totally destroyed. I saw a light at the end of the forest that had to be the road. The chupacabra's howl had caused others to come in my direction. I could hear them slowly approaching, ready to attack me. I limped towards the road, knowing that at any moment, 
One of them could launch itself at me at any time. Running out of energy, I reached the road, and in the street, a white light blinded me. Luckily for me, the truck didn't run me over by inches, and the concerned driver came to my rescue. After returning to the cabin, I alerted everyone that my friends were being attacked by a wild animal. To avoid questions, I didn't say it was a chupacabra, but when they found my teacher's body, the police quickly interrogated me. That same night, they found my friends still up in a tree. The chupacabras were trying to reach them until the last second and fled when they heard many humans approaching. My friends and I ended up in the hospital, although they were only there to accompany me. Everything we experienced was reported by a local news channel, and within minutes, it was forgotten. Filed away as another internet story that would be picked up by paranormal YouTube channels that no one believed. I still don't believe in all the legends and urban myths, but after what I experienced that day, I decided never again to risk checking it out. Why should I take the chance? <laughs>